Hello and welcome to the Nausicast. The Nausicast is where I go through each movie made by Studio Ghibli in release order and discuss our analysis and research findings. We are coming to you after somewhat of a long break. It's been a little bit unfortunate. Our schedules really made it sort of hard to uh, get together to record this episode. But finally, we're here. We're going to talk about The Wind Rises from uh, release in the year 2013 by director Hayao Miyazaki, which to date is also his last film, of course, though there's another one in production right now. So um, you can, as always, find this podcast on YouTube, on every podcasting app that you may use, on Libsyn, uh, on Spotify, and so on. And wherever you are uh, listening to this, there should also be a download available so that you can listen to it you know, on the go or whatever, what you prefer. With me today to talk about this movie are my uh, co-hosts and friends, Hipster Kasulu. Uh, I'm back. And uh, I'm he, him. Nyad forgot this time, but I didn't. <laughs> I- I'll get to my pronouns by the end of this. This is the uh, uh, tense uh, It's too arc. late now. I already called you out. Yes. Um, we also have Platon Skull. Hi, uh, my pronouns are he, him. Um, you know... The, the more I learn about uh, the Japanese Empire, pie, um, the, the more I don't care for it. Yeah. What a bold take. <laughs> mm, truly bold. And we have the Thunderer. Hello, I'm the Thunderer. Pronouns they, them, and no jokes, only Miyazaki. True. And as promised... Miyazaki famously hates jokes, so, you know... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just a really humorless uh, little cr- crank. About as humorless as my pronouns, which are he, him, by the way, because I'm Niat, your humble host. All right. So let's get into this movie. There's a lot to go through. This is actually a pretty dense one. So let's see how we're going to tackle this. Maybe we start with the usual uh, production background. Uh, From the inception of the idea to, I guess, its conclusion, to have a sort of narrative arc to that. it's kind of hard actually to say what this film is an adaptation of because it is an adaptation of too many things at once. So the lines are clearly blurred in many ways. So the first very obvious one is it seems to be at least in some way an adaptation of the novel The Wind Has Risen by Tatsuo Hori, which this movie, The Wind Rises, takes its romance plot from. But also, it is an adaptation of the life of the real-world aircraft engineer Jiro Horikoshi, who has been turned into the protagonist of the Tatsuo Hori novel. And, or rather, the Tatsuo Hori novel appears to happen during Horikoshi's lifetime. Which is interesting, to say the least, to have a biographical work, at least to some degree biographical, where Miyazaki completely ignores the real wife of Jiro Horikoshi, who lived to old age together with him <laughs> and instead yeah. takes a whole unrelated romance novel and puts it in there <laughs> but it, yeah it's uh it's, yeah. it's really interesting like uh it's it's miyasaki's first like film uh, maybe as aside from um uh, castle Cagliostro with like no magic in it it's a uh, it's just, like it's completely set in the real world and it's the protagonist is a real person um with a with a real story but uh, Miyazaki still adds this level of uh, this fictional layer to it by uh, by uh, adding this uh, this fictional romance uh, from uh, the uh, the Wind is Rising, um, which yeah. uh, from which the uh, film also gets its title. Yeah, he also couldn't help himself with like the dream sequences, which are their own kind of like weird magical stuff, and there's like monsters at the beginning, the the bombs that Jiro dreams of. So yeah, but like you know, they're, they're, still, they're really clear flair in it. Yeah, he he can't he can't help himself there. But it also is an adaptation of one of his own mangas, which he has been writing around the time of the completion of Ponyo, and uh, released in a magazine focused on. I, I believe it was a magazine focused on airplanes, actually, which was where even then, under the title "The Wind Rises," he wrote a small publication. Um, he drew a small publication where all the characters were pigs, actually. So we kind of recall Poco Rosso again with the sort of survivor's guild expressed as a pig, or rather, in this case, not survivor's guild, but the relationship to the war expressed as being pigs, where Jiro Horikoshi, as well, was a pig 
in in this manga version and also the uh, fusion with the Tatsu Ohori novel has already occurred in that manga. Tonally and narratively, obviously through the inclusion of pigs, and from what I could tell, I couldn't find a translated version, so I scrolled through the Japanese version, um, just looking at the pictures. It seemed to have a lot more levity to it and a lot more emphasis on centering the airplanes and the beauty of these planes themselves because uh, it was written for a more hobbyist-oriented magazine. So um, I guess we have an adaptation through an adaptation. So already Miyazaki took the source material and disfigured or shaped it or transformed it into a weird manga, which he then further adapted into a movie which is extremely different from the manga so really all we could say is that there are so many layers of separation between the source material and this movie that um we i I guess we, we can just say it's a really rare sort of degree of separation but kind of in line with if you remember how we talked in ponyo about sort of how miyazaki views influence and art as a sort of continuous flow that flows into one another and that is very much present here as well because it is also littered with other artistic references uh thomas mann's magic mountain comes up plenty of times a paul valery poem is quoted multiple times and you know i guess we could come up with any number of other literary references if we just you know tried hard enough (laughs) Yeah, like if, if we're talking visual references, also like the uh, uh, the the constant presence of uh, of of wind uh, in 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 the movie, like adding motion to the background and foreground, is very uh, very reminiscent of uh, Akira Kurosawa. Yeah, That's, and he also uh, ties in interesting like different parts of the history as well. Uh, like I mentioned with the dream sequences, we um we can talk about them later, but the um. The real life engineer uh, Caprone um, is also like deeply part of uh, Jiro's journey. Even though I don't know if there's any evidence that they ever even like met or talked or thought about each other <laughs> in real life, but like Miyazaki kind of weaves together all these like different parts of history and things that have clearly influenced him. Yeah, into this movie, Caprone yeah, also like that, clearly that's... being the one uh, uh, Italian aircraft engineer that influenced Miyazaki the most, I'd wager the guess, because Porco Rosso being set where it was set with the kinds of planes it had, I do think there has to be a relationship to Caproni. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, yeah, and I, like... actually, I would have thought that it was the uh, Caproni. Apparently Porco Rosso's uh, actual plane wasn't engineered by the Caproni company, but uh, plenty of other f- uh, like planes that have shown up in Miyazaki's work have been. So like, yeah, that kind of style of... Um, early 20th century Italian engineering, Miyazaki's always said, is like, you know, his favorite. So, yeah. And even just talking about the, uh, the source material, the, uh, the inspirations, we were already noticing some of the, uh, some of the tensions that, that are, we're going to be discussing, which like the, uh, the self insert, um, like angle uh, on it with, uh, with Caproni being a personal, like, uh, inspiration to Miyazaki and thus, being put in as a personal inspiration to uh, to Jiro, um, and also like the fact that this is the um, is, is the only Misaki movie that's like unapologetically like set in the real world in a real time, um, also, which adds some uh, some complexities to it that uh, that weren't present in his other works. Also, pretty clearly, the only work that we can easily say is much more adult oriented because Miyazaki has always made it a point to emphasize that he makes movies for children, and this. Ain't it, Chief? <laughs> yeah, he he actually uh, he he does mention at uh, one point in um in in documentary that he didn't intend Porco Rosso for children either. Like he didn't consider that a, a kids' yeah, movie. We discussed that uh, it yeah, was made I, I like for the airline where it was for tired salaryman. You're right. It's, it's kind of not <laughs> yeah. exact, but Porco Rosso is so playful that I think. Uh, I still want to make the point that Wind Rises is sort of singular in how seriously it is in, in its um, being for adults, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Yeah, Porco Rosso is like a movie that has a lot of deeper themes to it, but a kid could still just watch it and have fun at the, the bullshit that's happening on screen. But like The Wind Rises, you're right, it's like such, it's so structured weird as well, and it's like so painfully about all these adult topics that, yeah, I don't know if... Uh, 
even though it, this movie still didn't make like the best, like highest um, box office release in Japan, and like blowing everything else out of the water. So I guess it goes yeah. to show like, Miyazaki's staying power. So, uh, getting I guess into how the hell did it happen that Miyazaki chose this source material to adapt this challenging material too? Because obviously. Um, to try and make a movie about an airplane engineer who was heavily involved in building some of the most infamous planes of World War II, because yeah, uh, uh, he Hiro, was the in, in, yeah he was the inventor of the 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 zero the Japanese uh, zero yeah. airplane very very iconic and uh, like uh, as as far as I can tell like like famously well designed um, but also like uh, a symbol very much a symbol of Japanese aggression. Yeah, and and, and and of course Kamikaze, which we'll get to. Indeed, associated with Kamikaze, which is where we get to the contradiction that Miyazaki feels about this movie, which also has a huge part in how they he and Suzuki decided that this should be the work he should be adapting next after Ponyo, uh, namely the contradiction that Miyazaki, while being a pacifist, anti-military, uh, constantly uh, uh, talking about the horrors of war, but also clearly obsessed with the aesthetics of airplanes and flight, which obviously were used in military uh, uh, purposes. Because because of this contradiction, Suzuki basically approached Miyazaki and, and said, I want you to make this movie because I want to see how you deal with these contradictions of yourself. And I think it's going to be an interesting movie. And Miyazaki was at first really opposed to the idea of adapting this manga he's written, had, has been opposed to Suzuki's suggestion. But... It seems that what changed his mind was that a staff member suggested, uh, replying to Miyazaki's worry that this material would not be suited for ch suitable for children, suggested that you know children should be allowed to be exposed to subjects they're not familiar with, and that <laughs> appears to have changed Miyazaki's mind. That indeed, yeah, this might be something he should be adapting, which he still and I think all of us have seen Kingdom of Dreams and Madness, right? Throughout yeah, the yeah. entire production, kept stewing on. I think at no point have we ever seen Miyazaki this unsure and insecure about the material he's adapting. Mm. Yeah. So uh, the, the the Kingdom of Dreams and Madness uh, was a, a documentary uh, filmed uh, in and around the, uh, the uh, Studio Ghibli, uh, with like uh, like really following closely the production of uh, The Wind Rises in particular, while uh, Kaguya Hime was. Uh, being uh, made in in the I think it's the South Studio, um, and uh, and and it's 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 a fantastic documentary. And like if if you're listening to this and you haven't seen the documentary, what the hell are you doing? Um, like it's it, it's a must watch for for any Ghibli fan. But like also it's just really really well made and and poignant uh, look at at a at a like a master craftsman at the uh, at the tail end of his his career and this like. Uh, this workspace that would soon like not be uh, be there anymore. And yeah, also do watch the uh, NHK documentary. I'm sure we can link that in the description as well. Um, yeah. Because this movie, and typically we fight sometimes find it hard to dig up anything other than interviews about the movies. But this movie had two simultaneous documentaries being made about it uh, as the production was going on. So there's a lot of interesting stuff in the NHK one they were doing, almost like exactly side by side with Dreams and Madness. Yeah. Uh, the difference is just that NHK was a sort of TV or web show production. I think mm -hmm. even for the international audience, because they've got like English, uh, uh, an English narrator doing it, even though it's NHK Japan. Um, and uh, King of Dreams and Madness is like a really big production in terms of mm. uh, documentaries. I feel like this was a, well, a much more... I don't know the right words for it, but there's yeah, like Dreams a degree. and Madness, I believe, was even released uh, in like English-speaking countries as well. Yeah, they on the did the rounds at like that. festivals and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um. Okay, so getting into this, I mean, these documentaries show one thing very clearly, and I've alluded to it. I, I think it's worth mentioning just again. Miyazaki, or rather, I should say broadly, we've seen a few documentaries now uh, and like interviews and stuff about the production of certain Ghibli movies. It's interesting how Miyazaki's state of mind and all the things his mind is buzzing with at the time really is always really visible in the in the movie. And some, similarly, I think Miyazaki's confusion, internal contradictions, his frustration with the source material, he's 
he's taking a very long time to finalize the uh, storyboard for this movie. He's been struggling with coming up with an ending. Uh, it's one of those cases, again, where the ending wasn't even written by the time they had already started animating and voice acting, uh, uh, you know, since yeah, like early he, on the He even movie. changed dialogue on the ending by the, before the last minute. Exactly. So stuff like this, it, it's one where Miyazaki's visible emotional distress and confusion while making this movie, and he also complained a few times about how horrible, how horrible it actually is to make movies and that he doesn't feel like he has it in him anymore. It, it just reflects on the movie. You can kind of feel it, this complicated mess of emotions that he's been put in that is visible in both a uh, uh, documentary and movie. Um, we'll dig into this more when we get into you know, discussing all the thematics of the movie. But for now, I just think uh, a couple of quotes that really make it transparent how Miyazaki was feeling about his craft in that very moment while he was writing this movie is quotes such as, let me start, um, you know, people who design airplanes and machines, no matter how much they believe that what they do is good, the winds of time eventually turn them into tools of industrial civilization. Their cursed dreams. Animation too. So, it is very clear in this moment that he even challenges uh, 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 wonders, ponders why he even does the kind of animation he does. He even asks himself in King of Dreams and Madness the question like, how do we even know movies are worthwhile? Isn't it just some grand hobby? Maybe there was a time you could make films that matters, but not now. And those are some really deep uncertainties about his own, I guess, technology, his own craft that he brings to the table of this production. And I thought this is I guess the main gist of Kingdom of Dreams and Madness, this confusion. Well, this, uh, I, I wouldn't say it's, I wouldn't say it's confusing as, as much as it is, it's just like asking all the poignant questions. Like it's, it's questioning, it's not, it's not necessarily like uh, meandering or confused or, or messy, it's just... Well, I, I don't mean um, confused in that way, I yeah. just mean that I don't think he has the answers to these questions. And No, no yeah. absolutely, it, uh, and, and there, there aren't really any like firm answers in the, in the Wind Rises, which is what makes it one of the mo most like challenging movies uh, in, in, in the Ghibli canon. Um, it's, it's also like one of the... Um, one of the things that he also mentions near the end of the uh, uh, the documentary, uh, the, uh, the Kingdom of Dreams and Madness, is um, like he he asks like kind of rhetorically like is, is the goal of life really to make yourself happy? Because he doesn't believe that, and and th this is where he mentioned like you know movies don't make him happy. He he he's not like personally happy every day making these movies. But like he does it anyway, and he he sort of like poses this question to the um, to some of the animators working under him, and it's it's, it's sort of an open ended thing with like, well, if personal happiness isn't the goal, uh, what is, and uh, and what what sort of like society should we live in where something other than that is the priority, and uh, and and I think that question is like very central to. Uh, to the film and to to the story of Jiro as told by Miyazaki, this idea of uh, did Jiro live a worthwhile life? Mm. Um, and uh, and I I think it doesn't really have a clear answer to that. And I think that's something you could criticize as like uh, the, the movie not really like challenging uh, Jiro like hard enough to like find an answer. But, but I think it's 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 one of the the unique strengths of the movie. It definitely makes us ponder questions like that, uh, which have both at the same time a critical answer where you could criticize the movie for what it does as well as... And we will. And we will, as well as a deeply, I guess, the engagement itself with these questions is highly insightful, no matter how we like feel about the eventual... I wouldn't even say conclusion, because as I said, I think there's not many hardline conclusions except for, yeah, you, you have to live, you know? survival and stuff like this are also pretty central themes. And I almost feel like the craft of making ash, uh, uh, airplanes and animation is seen by Miyazaki as something that makes up who you are, what you do, your craft, but that you will do your craft in the circumstances you're put in regardless of, you know, your current life goal or whatever. Um, and, and this has a very personal relation to him and his family in relation to this war because, you know, his father and uncle had a company that manufactures man manufactures parts for warplanes like the Mitsubishi Zero. 
So personally, in his biography, he has, through his father, a sort of involvement in the production of these planes, but he refuses to sort of judge his father for that. He refuses to, how should I put it, um, judge them as if they had committed a moral crime or something of the sorts. He just saw them as living in the times that they were living in. Well, simply put, you know, um, that nobody at this time would have had the political courage to go against the militarism of the Japanese state and that Miyazaki cannot hold them accountable for being involved in that. And the same impulse, of course, has to do with how he interprets or sees or reads the protagonist, Jiro Horikoshi, who... Yeah, yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely, like, a lot of, the, like, Miyazaki in him, like, uh, as we mentioned, that there's, there's a really strong, like, uh, biographical reading, um, but there's definitely also some of, uh, a lot of his father in him. And, and, and I, th- I think the documentary, uh, The Kingdom of Dreams and Madness, uh, makes the case that um, much of the characterization of, uh, of Jiro is very much inspired by Miyazaki's uh, father. One of the more like moving parts of the documentary is uh, Miyazaki receives this letter from uh, well, from basically a stranger uh, who uh, a man uh, four years older than Miyazaki who when uh, when he was uh, uh, when this uh, uh, this man was uh, eight years old uh, he and his family lost their uh, their home in a in, in a firebombing and uh, and went to fi- seek shelter in a, in the Miyazaki home. And Miyazaki's dad like uh, came home, saw them, and went and like got them some chocolate and uh, and let them stay there. And uh, and and B- it, Miyazaki sort of like he writes back that like this like really helped him like rediscover his his, his father. And we see this sort of um, the, 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 this this sort of quiet uh, selflessness and generosity in Jiro as well. There's there's a few. Uh, key scenes where uh like specifically there's a scene where he like tries to give uh these like sponge cakes to to a group of uh kids who are like struggling with poverty um and uh, like so so there's obviously his uh he he's not only like uh wrestling with questions about his own like creative life and uh, and and its uh its purpose and its impact but also like uh the, uh, the 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 ghost of his father and uh, and his role in in the war and his uh, his virtues. Yeah, um, I like Jiro's characterization. There's also another scene right at the beginning of the movie that uh, uh, I noticed wasn't like meant to be this kind of strong emblematic part where he uh, defends this. Uh, yeah, very uh, this early kid in the being movie. bullied uh, by taking on like five kids, and we see that he's been beaten up by them. Like in the next scene. Uh, he does like a, a a keto throw to one of them, but yeah, it's like I think it was meant to kind of get across the idea that Jiro is kind of this he's this kind and kind of courageous person. So his pacifistic elements later in the film aren't like out of a cowardice or a reluctance. He simply like you know only follows what he believes or like what he wants to do. And I think yeah, Miyazaki he... wanted to get that across that kind of strong, uh, maybe maybe like very idealized man of like not just. The historical figure of Jiro himself, but also like Miyazaki and uh, his the way he sees his father. Abs- absolutely, absolutely. That that that's something I I really uh, noticed. Like on uh, on on a few rewatches, is like Jiro is, is is like a certain type of idealized Japanese man. Like he's he's um, he's like endlessly polite and uh, even headed. He has a very strong work ethic. He's a master of his craft. Like the, the, those are like really admirable qualities, and like um, so, and, and like that that like sense of like politeness, duty, and honor is is, is like very uh, like very old school Japanese uh, uh, like virtues. But even like even with all these like good uh, all this goodness in him, uh, he like goes into this uh, this world, and it does not really reward him with happiness or a good life and and the like that's one of the, again that question of like well did he live uh did this character live a, a life that's like uh worth something or, or what was did, did he fail at some point or did the world it, fail him it, it's interesting also you know we mentioned that um I was Jiro kind of can be reflected in, in in Miyazaki's father because of the you know of, of his like you know his stoicism his like you know his craftsmanship his kind of like you know 
moral, like, you know, personal moral, like, like compass. But he also says a similar thing about Miyazaki, right? Um, like, every Sunday, Miyazaki goes to the river to clean it up. That's, that's, it's a very important part. Miyazaki, he, he, he's, it's, it's very, very, they're very, very insistent about that, that being part of his ritual. Um, it's mentioned in the, in the documentary, in Dream, Dream, Kingdom of Dreams and Madness. And he talks about it in other interviews and the like, right? He's like, it's, it's, it's a very important part of his, his, his life. It's like this kind of like, this weekly ritual saying, I'm going to do the thing that's in front of me that is, I feel like is good. Um, but it's, it's interesting because, Miyazaki knows that that's not going to help the world very much. <laughs> he knows that he's very, 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 very limited, very much in front of his face, right? Um, where if you pair that to, like, say, his work in Pocoroso, it almost seems like that's more of a look. I have look, look at look at the war, the war in um in 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 the Balkans right now. I I need to address it somehow. I need to like you know interact with the world in a kind of meaningful way. But like this kind of step back, it kind of makes you think about Jiro. Um, later on in the movie, when he goes to help someone, like the other other time he goes to help someone in front of him, you know, besides when he was a kid, when he's an adult, um, he sees these two these two kids, um, who like are clearly like starving, and he you know attempts to give them food, and they like kind of they kind of run away, and it's like he kind of like has this kind of like what just happened there, kind of like you know impression on his face. He does this kind of like complete detachment, right, in this kind of like moral character. It it works to. For Injiro's case and in Miyazaki's case, to almost give himself like a sense of good conscience, like I am a good person, I do the good thing in front of me, but it doesn't address any of the big issues. And I think yeah, yeah, that, that, Miyazaki's that's almost an, criticizing himself with that. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's an uh, admirable idealism, uh, but also a na- naivete to uh, to Jiro, which, uh, yeah. depending on your reading, might be like the tragic flaw of the character. Well, yeah, that's like Miyazaki's. Uh, uh, as we said, like with the biographical thing, that's means like it's kind of like fundamental anxiety for the film, not with, just with Jiro, but like with himself. Of like, also especially thinking that at this point in his career, he's like the most decorated and most like respected director in living in the country, uh, like the biggest figure yeah, in the an, history animated of anime. Or otherwise, yeah, yeah, animated or otherwise, biggest figure history in the country, and he's like constantly respected and awarded and told that his movies are just like the fucking best thing ever. But he's just still wondering to himself, like, well, did it make any difference? Did he like do any good? Um, I can't remember exactly where the quote came from, but it was, it was one thing about like Miyazaki saying, you know, like he was, he wants to make movies for children to tell them to like go outside and live their lives. But he feels like his movies have just made people like, like watch more anime and like stay indoors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like they've almost had the opposite effect by being too yeah, good. Yeah. I think he said that during Ponyo and this is one of the main things where uh, he really, this is one of the aspects that makes him think his craft is cursed because he, he doesn't even really know if they help anything at all except for, you know, make people watch the movie which he doesn't consider very valuable in itself. Which... It is such a rough sentiment that, you know, also like a Jiro thing, right? His craft mm. is making animation. And Jiro's airplanes were used for, you know, war. Jiro didn't want this, obviously, but it was still his craft, so he stuck to it. That's because that's yeah. the only thing I he was the idea, able to do. Like, we see in the movie that, like, the Navy is going to just, like, get a fighter plane uh, either way from some other company. So, like, Jiro not making a fighter plane probably wouldn't have done anything at all for the war. But like you know, he still makes a really good fighter plane in the end, and it's it's like again this conflict of was was being like the best ever at this job like bad in overall yeah. like was it a ne- yeah. negative for everyone? What I think is interesting um, is how clearly Miyazaki speaks about the beauty of aviation. He doesn't really anymore speak about the beauty of animation. But I feel like, or I wonder if there's something similar because when he talks about his work he tends to now sort of stress it is kind of pointless or frustrating or cursed or doesn't do much for anyone but he still does it so i'm really curious if he just keeps the parts where he actually admires animation and the craft he does as much as he ever admires a- aviation and just doesn't really like to talk about that aspect because i i i honestly can see it um yeah well like I, th- I think that's part of the, the the movie being like questioning. It's asking those questions uh, through the the highest stakes possible. You know, it's a, it, it's it's not just like a, an autobiographical movie about a, an animator uh, looking for the purpose of their life. No, no, it's he 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 takes this his uh, his fascination with uh, with these airplanes, this tension between his uh, his love of aviation, his hatred of war. Um, and uh, and puts it into this character 
and adds this humanism to him from his own experience to explore this question uh, in, in, in a way that also ties into like broader uh, questions of uh, Japanese identity. It's 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 really ambitious and uh, like and I, I think the result is like challenging, but like overall like uh, really really uh, uh, hits home. Yeah, I don't know if there's something we should we can do quite yet, but um, um, I want to 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 expand on something Hipster said about um about the quote he said about uh, making and it, Mizaki's movies making people stay inside, right? Um, this this kind of like and and, and earlier we would, someone I don't remember who said this, but I mentioned a quote of his about um. Um, about filmmaking being like one some some grand hobby, and it makes you think about like well, what's what's this, this kind of hobbyist tendency, this kind of like interest in like making planes and, and making animation and like doing these things as a craft as something because I just you know I like it, I find it beautiful. That's one of the things I want to do. It's especially interesting in the context of who is cast um as Jiro's voice um, um Hideo yes, Ano, yeah. you know, as <laughs> like, perhaps you know the king of the king the king of otaku, um in a way. Um, yeah, who's who currently doing a... Ultraman, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's <laughs> so, making Shin yeah. Ultraman, which I'm very yeah. excited for. Oh, yeah. someone, who, someone who went to anime himself in, in in part because of his, you know, work with and his inspiration by, you know, Miyazaki's work. Um, so this kind of like... Working early on Nausicaa, um, right? That the, yes, he did the um, God Warrior animation in the Nausicaa yes. movie. Yes. Um, um, it, 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 interesting because, you know... Like Otto's, you know, of course, most famous work is um is Evangelion, and like if there's any work that kind of tries to address the whole, you know, kind of ethos and like, like um, um, and like um, what do you call it um, and like it, it, it mind state of, of of the of the otaku of the of the hobbyist of the person who just finds beauty in watching TV in the room, <laughs> um, and these people who don't have you know who just just build these things without any kind of interest or you know. Like idea about changing the world in the way that Miyazaki does. Um, not saying that they don't, but this kind of like kind of obsessive, fantastical urge um, that um, the wind rises in character. It's 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 it's, 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 it's just interesting that Ano is the worst person that Miyazaki cast in this role, even though Miyazaki is scared himself of appearing in this this way. Um. Yeah, um, his relationship with Anno is, is a pretty interesting one. Not only is it very funny, uh, particularly the scene in the documentary where they pick Anno and they're yeah, kind of making yeah. fun of him having a weird voice, but then Miyazaki's <laughs> like, wait, no, you've convinced me. He's perfect for the role in like two minutes. <laughs> it's so um, sweet. Like, And also like uh, seeing Anno in, in the audition room and just him and Miyazaki just like really having fun with like like and, and like uh, bantering a bit. It's, yeah, it's just uh, it's, so... It's just so lively. He being so inspired. Uh, funny enough, I actually watched uh, uh, was it uh, Aoi Hono recently, which is like the fictionalized story of uh, the creation of Gainax. Uh, and like Anno is in the movie, is in the, in the show, portrayed as like this completely deranged otaku, and he's like <laughs> obsessing over Miyazaki's cuts in the first season of Loop in the Third, and like pointing them out. Uh, and it's so funny that like yeah, years later they're working together. Uh, and even even still, that you can see that boyishness in him because there's the scene also where he, like Miyazaki asks him to do it, and uh, Anno just says, "I could never say no to you." That's uh, so beautiful. To, 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 to Miyasan, mm. <laughs> which is his nickname among friends. Yeah, but but it's definitely true. Like how fun, uh, how how nice this selection process of Anno was. I kind of want to go into that scene from the documentary just because they're like sitting around the table, they're struggling, they're like. We need someone to voice Jiro. We need someone. Yeah. Intellectuals in that time, they spoke with a very clear, uh, 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 earnest voice. They didn't use too many words. They aren't introverts, but they are concise. They don't use many words. Who can we get to talk like this? And they all like, mm, we don't really know. Voice actors just always sound like voice actors. They don't sound like this. So Suzuki says, hey, what if we take someone who isn't a voice actor? What about Arno? Mizaki's like, Anno? Everyone kind of laughs at Everyone the idea. Laughing? And so it's like, oh, that 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 that, 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 might, that might be fun. That, that might work. And they're like, brief second, and then he's like, hang on, I'm being serious now. <laughs> being serious. <laughs> that, that's a great idea. Let's let, let's get him in. Yeah. To the point where Suzuki, it looks like Suzuki realizes his joke has now become the reality that he didn't intend. <laughs> like, it's amazing. Um, but yeah, I think Anno is another great example because yeah, like Anno is like the example of like he's seen even again like in like depictions of him in other media and stuff like Anno is like the quintessential otaku he helped like 
really define what otakuism was in like the the mid to late eighties. Yeah, Gainax, but with, but with, with, with the boom, yeah, the creation of Gainax, like the otaku studio, but founded just, by yeah. a bunch of like guys who started on doing fan films uh, for Daikon, yeah. and like slowly made like the most important like otaku works. But, but, but and I think it's really that relationship with like Miyazaki. He he wants to like be separate from it because he sees all the flaws in it, but he also still can't help himself. Uh, like there's the the famous funny cut in. Kingdoms of Dream and Madness, where he's complaining about people who are obsessed over planes as otakus, then it cuts to him and Anno playing with planes like they're toys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, Miyazaki no, really no, can't no, no, get they, away they, from that uh, no, part they, of don't himself. Don't worry, they, they, were, they weren't playing with planes. They were yeah. um, they, they, they were studying to, to, to make a storyboard cut of yeah, like, how yeah. the plane would yeah, exactly. fly. Obviously. Exactly. <laughs> studying the plane while making yes. room noises with your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a beautiful moment. I think, uh, you know, it, as a documentary, it doesn't add much commentary to the th scenes that it shows, but that was such a deliberate cut that I think really got at the heart of some of the things that The Wind Rises is doing. But it almost, you know, I, I think Arno is such a fitting character in that moment uh, as, a, as a director himself, because obviously we have framed him so far as one of the leading figures associated with otakuism and a lot of call otaku works but we shouldn't forget how fucking critical evangelion is of otaku in a in a sense how conflicted how self uh, uh contradictory how depressive it almost is about the life and lifeblood of an otaku and that m seems already much more similar to miyazaki that there's sort of this self uh, uh not self-loathing but the self-denying of these passions in them in both of them so that makes them a great fit in this, uh, in the, in this sense, actually. Yeah, uh, actually, the the biggest uh, the the biggest disappointment of this entire thing, uh, watching the NHK documentary, there's actually a bit where jokingly Miyazaki suggests that he should voice Jiro's boss in the film, <laughs> and that would have actually been beyond perfect if that actually happened. Uh, Man, is uh, uh, the guy who takes him in and uh, marries it gets him, make sure he gets married. I mean, while we're talking about that, right, there's also one thing that goes into the opposite direction, which I found in an interview. Basically, that during production, there was a time where Miyazaki wasn't feeling well uh, uh, health-wise, and he locked himself in his room and refused to see a doctor. And um, he said, basically, even if I die, I have to finish my storyboard. And Arno basically said, if you disappear, I'll, leave the st uh, I'll finish the storyboard for you. So that's... A weird alternative future that didn't happen. Mm. Fortunately, Miyazaki survived to yeah. make this movie. But like they were s really closely intertwined. Interesting enough, because honestly, Arno is just the voice actor of the protagonist, but clearly stuck around for a lot of the process and was quite involved. Yeah, mm. um, I, 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 I think it's a. Uh, it's about time we we like dug deeper into the. Uh, uh, the the biographical reading because we, we've we've sort of like already mentioned parts of the uh, the, the thematic work of the movie, uh, but I, I, I think we sh uh, ha like pu putting a production aside, we should like dive deep into like Jiro as as a character. Yeah. Um, so because like he is like so so central to the he is the um, he is the movie. Indeed. Like he, he's he's maybe the only like real really like three dimensional developed character in the whole thing he's in every scene he's he's the uh he, yeah, he, he, get, yeah. he is like the, it's all from his point of view and to make this transition really smoothly another thing that really how should i put it inspired miyazaki to make this film was reading a quote by the real jiro horikoshi which read all i wanted to do was make something beautiful so even yeah, though this is. is a very very fictionalized account of this a aircraft engineer this real sentiment of his is what this movie is about. The sort of internal struggle of this, you know, engineer who just wants to come from a Japan that is, you know, at the beginning of the movie during Jiro's childhood, still like basically medieval, wooden paper buildings everywhere, almost no electricity or gas or whatever, no infrastructure, to bring them into the air, to have them have fly airplanes, you know. This little simple dream just fractured and distorted by the times they were had in the, those dreams. Yeah, yeah. And this is uh, also why Miyazaki talks about the title of the film, right? The wind in the title is not 
uh, I, I guess I can quote him. The wind is not something that blows reflect. Ref- uh, sorry. The wind is not something that blows refreshingly, but a terrifying wind that roars and shakes trees, like after a nuclear power plant that exploded. Uh, uh, to bring or the, perhaps after yeah. an earthquake. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, or after an earthquake. But of course, that is linked to the nuclear power plant exploding. This is like kind of the backdrop under which Miyazaki has been writing the film. Of course, the Fukushima, uh, uh, you know, disaster is in the in on the minds of people, and which is also reflected in Horikoshi's own biography of encountering the great great Kanto earthquake, uh, uh, which led to all of Tokyo burning down. But I guess we'll also get into that. Um, yeah, but I definitely we have many, many quotes. I don't know if I should go through all of them of Miyazaki ruminating ar- about the idea of how to even depict someone like Jiro Horikoshi. How do you depict a character admittedly passionate about aviation, but also indirectly responsible for the deaths of tens and tens of thousands of people during World War II? And even Miyazaki's wife disagreed that he would make a movie on uh, Jiro Horikoshi and said, make something like Totoro. But Miyazaki said, that film has already been made. So there we go. <laughs> Twice, actually, with, with Ponyo. Well, um, <laughs> well um, like, uh, let me just, for, for, for a quick second, like, zoom in on the, on the, like, opening five minutes of this movie because they are, like, really masterfully done. Like, first of all, you have this dream sequence which establishes uh, the themes of, like, dreams turning into nightmares uh, with, with the... Uh, the, the 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 weird like blobby magical bombs from the uh uh the uh, coming in and like overshadowing this dream of flight. Um, Interesting. And those 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 ships have um the um the Iron Cross of Germany on them. Yeah, um. yeah. We'll, we'll we'll get to that. Um, it's uh yeah. Uh, that, that's one of the complexities of the movie. Um, uh, then like he wakes up and it's uh it becomes clear that like uh, one of his issues is his nearsightedness which means he won't be able to fly and he needs those glasses to even like, he can't even see the shooting stars outside or make a wish because, because of that. Like it's, it's pretty direct. Um, but we also get like uh, early in the movie, him walking through the town and we immediately see the um, emerging technology and the backwardsness, uh, quote unquote backwardsness of, uh, of Japan in the, uh, I, I, I believe it would be in the 1910s, the, the scene is, uh, or like late 1910s, early 1920s, um, where he, what we, we walk past a, like a, a very simple locomotive that's like going past. Then we see uh, people like with horses, uh, like horse-drawn carriages, uh, people-drawn carriages and bicycles are, are there like really close by. So we immediately see this contrast between like the, uh, uh, the, the the rural uh, Japan of this beginning industrialization is established visually without like having to be told, and that's a thing that goes through the whole movie. Is this like uh, increasing industrialization? Uh, trains are like a recurring motif, um, getting like uh, and their contrast with the uh, with rural Japan. There's, there's a particular shot. Um, in the movie when uh, Jiro as, as, as an adult is, is like headed for the factory where the, um, where the, the train is running past these like uh, fields of like uh, hay thatched roofs, um, roofed uh, buildings and, uh, and, and farmers fields. And, 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 and these like groups of people who are just hanging out on the, on the hill, they, they like have to run, a, run aside for the train. It almost hits them. There's, there's this sense that this industrialization is coming uh, not for the benefit of, uh, of of those types of Japanese, but like at the uh, to their detriment. Uh, it it goes elsewhere, which is a, an ongoing thing in the movie. And it's just like the way it sets up all those themes in like the first five minutes. I I I, I just wanted to mention like that that's that's some good shit right there. Yeah, that, that's very true. Um, but also I uh, uh, find it interesting how you talk about this rapid technological change as something that isn't good for everybody there uh, 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 in, I guess, in Japan. Um, One thing that I noticed is how centralized for the early parts of the movie the Great Kanto Earthquake is, which literally like burns down all of Tokyo, which at the time was mainly constructed out of wood and paper materials and happened to, you know, if fires break out and you which they did plenty of spaces. I think I read somewhere that the reason fires broke out so much in Tokyo at that time was because the earthquake hit at a time where, you know, people would be cooking food on their stoves. 
So tons yeah. of buildings at once caught fire and like the, the entire and everything city burned down. All, all, all the buildings were made of wood also. Uh, exactly. Narrow streets and such. Like, like all, all, all these like things that like would not be a problem in the modern day, but like yeah. because of the technological level that, uh, that Tokyo was at at the moment was part of why it, uh, it got hit so hard. And the point I was getting at is while progress is happening, this... And then this is a real historical event, so it's not like entirely symbolism, but it is really symbolic for the rapid onset of modern uh, modernism in Japan, for the extreme make everything new all at once, because our whole capital city literally burned down, and now it's going to be rebuilt from the ground up. That is like a strong symbol of modernist sentiments in general, as this extremely fast transition from one to the next, into from the old into something uh. new. There's also an interesting line in that, which is, uh, it's, it's weird to take it. I think it's meant to be kind of, there's a there's a contrast in this movie about Japan uh, trying to rapidly modernize as it grows towards being like a, a massive war machine in the 30s and 40s. Uh, but it's kind of like almost the Japan is also kind of resisting in its own modernization because there's a, just a one great line from Jiro where they're walking through the streets of the reconstructed Tokyo and he goes, everything looks pretty much the same. I guess the streets are a bit wider. Like they they built back the city pretty much the exact same way already. Like you already see them going into like traditional style buildings anyway. Like they they built back everything in this kind of idea that I I think Miyazaki's getting at the that Japan wanted to be like very modern and like the 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 fascist Germans with that with their empire, but like Japan um, wasn't like very good at it or like uh, resisted this idea. Uh, to some capacity and like i think that's emblematic through the um the heavy use of um the traditionalist imagery in this film to be almost entirely in a positive light if we flash forward to like uh, jiro's wedding sequence which is done entirely in like a massive old style wooden house in the uh, traditional style they're all wearing like the kimonos and the proper formal clothing i, I would and, that like that, that this I would, like, I would, almost this ghostly soul of the Japanese tradition in this like last flame before yeah. it becomes a modern uh, warlike nation. I, I wouldn't present that as a positive thing, but we can get that later. Well, um, it's I, I think it's I, positive in some ways. I guess you're right. Like there's certainly like very anyway. da- the, yeah, there's very like dour moments of yeah. it, but it's it's kind of like hauntingly nostalgic. But, but I think with the with with the, I, think, I think another interesting thing to, to note with the earthquake. I'm not sure from where I read this, but um, apparently the earthquake wasn't. Initially, like in the initial like 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 there's like ideas of the film you know like you know a few years back before the film's like actual production started the earthquake was going to be a historical event but it wasn't meant to be that kind of extreme violence and the kind of the reason why the film was structured in that specific way was because of the you know the earthquake the, the and, and, and the and, and that happened in japan in 2011 um and the, the earthquake was kind of modeled after the, the kind of extreme you know violence that you know came with that you know like 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 something like like thirty thousand people in Japan died in the two thousand eleven. Yeah, yeah um, it was, it was, it was. I, mean, I think we mentioned in the last in the last cast where like you know the studio Ghibli was like you know out of power for for large parts and so they they they, they had the troubled end of their production um, schedule for um for wait what, what, uh, from from off in Poppy Hill um but this kind of like depiction and and the, and the earthquake is by far the most violent like scene in the whole movie like like there's yeah, no, yeah. you know even it compares like shit yeah the, the, um, that scene is just fucking immaculately animated just the sheer like scale and and terror and and almost almost otherworldliness of the way the ground moves and that yeah uh, the sound is just the amazing. sound work done in the, in the in that scene is particularly amazing like it's, oh, it's yeah, less yeah, yeah. like an earthquake and it's more like this groaning monster reminds me of some of the work they used in uh Princess Mononoke for the uh, the the possessed monsters, like this deep bassy rumbling of like the earth itself, almost like rejecting the land, and it's like and, uh, like horrific, and the winds are like uh like uh, howling. And, yeah, and I, don't um, remember, I don't remember the, if we've said anything about this, but um, we all have, the yeah, sound no. effects in the in the film um were done by um human basically he, 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 were yeah by yeah human, I remember like, hearing like, that as vocals, well. right? And like in this earthquake, you can really see it like here. It's like it's 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 almost like that like the kind of like human violences we we like that were kind of shielded from the film are almost like carried through this kind of natural disaster. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. Th- yeah. thinking about so a little you, bit you, of the through line while we're on that, right? It's it's a subjectivized nature 
but very different from what Miyazaki tends to do in his movies when it comes to nature. We've discussed this theme of his work in My Neighbor Totoro, in Mononoke Himo, wherever it's appropriate, really, it's pretty often. Uh, but this time, you can really see that this movie is about technology, about civilization, about um, all of these things. And not about nature, but still there's like this this one backlash, this one huge eruption of nature onto civilization. It's a pretty potent image. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, just, just it's just particularly violent the... because um I believe the NHK documentary shows that like Miyazaki was starting to do the storyboards of when the earthquake would be in the movie, like he was he was just doing the planning stage, and then the Fukushima disaster like hit then. And uh, they actually, like, yeah, they left the office and with this footage of them, like, doing relief effort, like, the him and Suzuki, like, went to a, uh, like, I think it was, like, a refugee place where people were displaced and they were, like, handing out autographs and, like, you know, just trying to, like, raise the spirits of the people there, like, and seeing all the, the, the disaster and, like, Miyazaki wanted to see firsthand the literal destruction that this massive earthquake caused. Yeah. Yeah, there's also a scene in uh, The Kingdom of Dreams and Madness where he talks about how there's, there was this sense of foreboding in the air before the uh, before the disaster hit. And and he talks about how, like, there, uh, he still feels this sense of foreboding, like, like there's, like, so, something's got, got to give. Um, and, and how, like, he doesn't, like, exactly know what it felt like to be, like, an adult in, in the pre-war time. Um, but he, he, so, he he's starting to sympathize in his old age. And, uh, and 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 I think like one one of the strengths of the movie is this this sense of foreboding in the air, this uh, this looming specter of war on the horizon that's like yeah. uh, that goes through the whole thing. If faith, the interesting thing about this whole kind of event is um is is, 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 is while while the war is kind of being shadowed in the future um, from this event, it also kind of is our first depiction of war memory in the film so far. And so I want to like just touch on that just quickly before we we go out and talk about that because we'll talk about that more extensively later, but. Because in the usual um, depiction in Japanese, you know, war memory of the of war is there was a violent event and that led to suffering people. And what matters in these kind of depictions, generally, especially in the post, the immediate post war is the kind of sensationalized depictions of said suffering people. There's this idea of the of the mon, the monte, which is like the working woman's pants, right? And it's the whole idea of like these these people who like have a hard life. They like you know have this like these. these they 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 exist in kind of rubbles of like Japan and like are just and, and reconstruct it. Um, um, and, and and it's interesting because um in in this thing we we have that kind of depiction the the Monpei depiction right we have like the the lines of people like um going to get water um at the well and we have like the little girl um um who the main character saves um and gets brings back to her family and those these kinds of these, these kind of things but it almost feels very neutrally presented as in it's kind of there. Like it's clearly a lot of people suffered and a lot of things broke, but they kind of just, okay, that happened. And they kind of move on. Right. There's kind of this, kind of this, this moment of loss, but the reflection after, after a few seconds of reflection, they just do walk out and they reconstruct Japan. Um, but that's completely different than how the actual disaster itself is depicted, which is with extreme violence. Um, right. Like, like in, in, with the, 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 the violence almost doesn't seem like it has a, 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 the person receiving it, right? The violence itself is the subject rather than the pe- the victims being this kind of subject, right? Yeah, um, you, you don't really see anyone dying when, when yeah. the earthquake is, but you do see like the violence inflicted on the landscape and the city and yeah. there's this quiet right afterwards and that gets broken by like a child yeah. crying and that's like all you need to know. It's like, holy shit. Yeah. And, 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 and I don't want to like go into it because it's my full theory about this, but I think it's it's really evocative of how this film approaches war memory um mm, yeah, which, which we'll, uh, yeah. we'll get into deeper uh, later on yeah. the um, most just, just as emblematic uh, just a, a yeah. note about, oh, sorry go, go ahead Neon. Uh, i was still going to add on to more of the depiction of the earthquake so i think uh yeah. Yeah. so the, the the scene that most interestingly expresses to me what this earthquake scene really signifies is when between the st- the earthquake happens and Jiro ends up finding uh, the home of the girls uh, um, that he helped recover. Uh, he later goes to find the university he wanted to go to or the school and finds mm. that uh, the young men are, have have carried out all the books out of the library and have started stacking them up there. The, the ones they could carry anyway. Uh, exactly. And then they, they sit down 
on top of these books, looking at the devastation while having a chill smoke as the books behind <laughs> them start burning. Then yeah. we cut, hard cut to um, the the um, like a, a vision of an of of like an Italian plane crash, like of the of the of the Caproni airplane crash, and then. Uh, uh, Caproni asks the question of, is the wind still blowing? Then you have to live. As Giro gets up and starts trying to, you know, knock out the the, the fire that is starting to yeah. burn on the books. Of course, we should get the implication at this point that all the books were lost. And that um, this is such a strong expression of transformation of technology. Uh, or transformation through technology in itself. Because all the symbolism yeah. in that small scene, like the books related to aircraft engineering, the crashing airplane, and the, you know notion that afterwards all of this has to be rebuilt just the same that Tokyo has to be rebuilt. An airplane which failed once, which crashed, will have to be re-engineered and rebuilt as well. This is like, how, the, in this way, all the entire earthquake to me becomes extremely liminal. So if a film critic, uh, David Ehrlich, um, wrote a very, very, very uh, glowing review uh, for MTV.com in which he notes um, talking about uh, the, the, the themes of like, Uh, how uh, he says the purest of dreams can be perverted into nightmares. He writes, it's no coincidence that the same wind that invokes the meat cute between Jiro and Naoko moments later spreads a fire across Tokyo that raises the great city to the ground. Oh, that that's also pretty good. Uh, uh, that's a really, yeah, really yeah, good yeah. observation. Like it's it, like just minutes earlier, like the same wind, like put, put these two people together and, and like became the, the seed of this like pure love romance we, we get later Let, let's but get, it also yeah. like carries the fire uh, yeah. throughout the Let, city let's get really, really good broad. matching symbolism <laughs> uh, uh, i also quite liked um the other matching symbolism between him and naoko and the, the kind of the destructive wind is he has the dream about the zero initially and he imagines it as a paper airplane like this weightless simple uh, plane of beauty Uh, that he throws off into the world and, you know, kind of like uncontrollably becomes a killing machine. Uh, but also the way he, he gets Naoko's attention and like as like a cute like gesture of his love is he throws her uh, paper aeroplane into her like, you know, balcony. She's like in this high up almost princess in a tower. It's very like a uh, storybook kind of look. And he reaches yeah. her through his paper aeroplanes, through his engineering and his dreams. Yes, story, storybook is the right word for it. That, that, that again, it gets back to this this naivete of the character uh, of of Jiro. Um, like th this this pure love romance parallels his his pure passion for uh, for aero engineering. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and 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 it's um, it's it, it's it's sort of it's 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 sort of tragic uh, in a way. Uh, this uh, th th this uh, th this parallel because like obviously like. She uh, has tuber tuberculosis, uh, which was very, very not curable back then. Yeah. Um, and uh, like a very fatal disease. I, um, and so it's yeah. it, like in the same way that their romance is, is is doomed. Like his his love of airplanes is is also doomed to to end in tragedy. I'll get really broad about reading the significance of the earthquake in here, and I'll just say in a very broad thesis, try to elaborate it sure. a, a little bit after. But I think catastrophe is the main uh, uh, signification this movie has for basically every event and for life itself. So when we think about catastrophe in this movie, we can list many of them. We can start with the Great Kanto Earthquake, which marks the transforming point, not just the incisive moment where he meets Naoko and kind of gets you know, to know her as the little girl, Uh, but also um, the transformation of Tokyo, also the transformation of his his um, future, you know, school, all of these things. These this is literally like physically the liminal space between you know his train ride out of his home to Tokyo into the modern world. But also we have more catastrophes that also have the same amount of signification. We have the uh, uh, illness of Narco that you addressed, Blayton. The illness that in itself has caused and formed and shaped the character first of their future meetings but second also of how their entire marriage would go but then also the catastrophe of the war which of course shaped the entirety of Jiro's career and you know outlook into the future and let's take this a bit more contemporary uh, uh, into the contemporary perspective from which Miyazaki is writing this 
we have a similar thing because Miyazaki has also written the script from up from up on Poppy Hill. Watch the podcast episode on that to hear us talk about that. Where catastrophe, the memory of war, was also the inciting and main driver of these children growing up in the generation after to interpret their own history, their own groundedness in the world. And also Miyazaki, while making The Wind Rises, in quotes, famously, uh, not famously, said, um, I'm trying to find the quote, but he said that after the 2011 earthquake and the financial crisis of 2008, he could no longer do fantasy. It would be a lie. So for him, even these current day catastrophes still serve as the main signification of how to interpret your current times, how to interpret the world, how to interpret your own life and so on. Like what kind of art means is framed by catastrophes. And that is a very, very central thing that Miyazaki plays with even this movie, which I find so interesting in centering the earthquake in the early parts of the movie. I just want to say um, tuberculosis is an airborne disease. Um, oh mm. damn! I was going to also <laughs> hey, say that for tuberculosis, maybe I'm reading way too much into this, but I thought it's an interesting thing with um, the historical nature of the film, because tuberculosis particularly is a disease that, with modern medicine, is quite quite curable today. Like yeah. very few people die of it. Like well, penicillin so, is all that's needed, right? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, that's, that's so now entirely true. Old people. Well, like, if you have access to modern um, medicine, like yeah. in a, in like a reasonably well off country, is what I mean. I guess, it, it, particularly in Japan, I, I wouldn't. know. You know how many people in Japan die of tuberculosis these days? I can't imagine it's too many. But either way, it's kind of the thing where it's like, it's something that most people would view as pretty preventable today. But because of the movies like trapped in its time, we're kind of seeing this tragedy unfold that we know, like, you know, if it was only a couple of years later, maybe she would be totally fine. But like, she's trapped in her time, in her world, like Jiro is with the, uh, the looming war. And that's this constant uh, theme throughout the movie of like, Jiro and uh, everyone in Japan is headed towards the war, and there's like nothing. There's nothing that's going to stop it. Like, uh, as the character, the German character says, Japan is going to explode. Like, yeah, it's this inevitable like time bomb. That's um, you know, just one one point I'd like to like get back to before we okay. uh, we go too far because uh, we we mentioned earlier the uh, the sound design of the movie, where like all the airplane noises and also like the sounds of the earthquake are made using uh, a human mouth uh, you, you can hear it if, if you you already notice there's something a bit off about it but if you if you listen to it and listen for it you hear it immediately the uh the like it's it's made with, with human sounds and like good sound editing um and i th i think that's just such an interesting choice that also plays into this sense of of childish naivete that like these uh these machines that that have like uh, today they're like symbols of destruction, but from Jiro's perspective, they're just like machines of wonder. They're they're like, uh, it's 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 playful. It's uh, it it's kids playing around with these uh, these things. It it, yeah. it really just emphasizes that childishness. But yeah, I think even like, even the way they're animated as well. They're like almost yeah, organic yeah. in parts. Like they'll like bulge and twist and like move in ways that like you know yeah, if you were to the soft accurately and... yeah if you were to accurately display it, they'd be a lot more rigid. But like there's this like a living nature to the planes in the film that Miyazaki yeah. always draws, which I think Mi is Miyazaki, is Miyazaki had a, had trouble. Uh, like according to the documentary, like had trouble animating the zero planes because like he 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 had trouble um so, so someone in the documentary described that like well one of the issues is he has this thing in his imagination how they would flow they're they're, he, they're so revered these airplanes uh to him and the uh, the other animators on the team can't give him that and so so he had a lot of trouble like getting uh getting the animation cut right you know i find it interesting how um that um so the organic nature is especially is is almost like most strongly emphasized in the very beginning of the film, right? With like the the, the bombs that are like like monsters. Um, oh yeah, and and those bombs they look very similar to um the monsters from um House Moving Castle. Um, yeah, um, yeah, the the, the, the blobby. Yeah, they used uh, zeppelins black. in those as well, yeah. right? So they like, had, like kind, kind of, of turn of the and, century planes. And that's our first, like you know, depiction of like you know planes in warfare, right? We don't we don't get to start with the zero really, except we, we kind of get his plane, but like which is a sort of prototype of it. But really, the most most of what you come across are these kind of violent creatures at the very beginning, and later later on when everything gets less 
you know, enduro subjectivity, you know, becomes more quote unquote realistic. And he sees the planes as organic, but not kind of like monstrous or like, you know, morphing. There's, you still kind of remember that kind of initial depiction of the plane. <laughs> I yeah. feel like so, which is but, you know, and, but, and of course, what, how the division of the plane is entirely as a weapon of like, like you know, violence and war. I think the Not subject, as, yeah. is the subjectivization of planes through human noises, through all these dreamy uh, uh, aspirations, mm -hmm. is almost positing the ethical question that the movie is also explicitly positing later on: of our planes, our tech, is technology, is art an end in itself? Is it worth any cost? The a line that uh, Caproni says about would you rather live in a world with pyramids or a world without pyramids? Um, where the, you know, almost like subject status that um, planes become makes them much more than an object, but something in itself worthwhile. Something so important to the characters in the movie because, not because of, you know, it's it's really hard to wrap my head around, but it, it, Miyazaki turns them into subjects that are ends in themselves, kind of like the, the yeah, you know, yeah, in, in, intrinsically ethics. valuable intrinsically for their beauty. Intrinsically valuable, yeah. Something alive, something that organically develops. And of course, this is in a way what technology is, right? Technology is developing inevitable. And we've talked about technology in Miyazaki works before. Let's take Laputa and Mononoke Hime. Those are like the two biggest examples where in Laputa, technology is seen as something as long as you have gained the technology it will be a sort of cursed knowledge basically if you know of the weapon's existence the weapon will lead you to desire it to crave it but in mononoke Hima, we change to technology technological progress always comes at this inevitable tragedy that progress of humans building communities crashing into the woods making a space to live in will always uh, result in a loss of something else and this loss inherent to technology is again the motif that this movie seems to center around where technology almost grows organically with and around people as they grow and uh, uh, and you know invent and and develop passions but inevitably the same growth turns into a curse by nature of how this knowledge this, this existing technology will be used which is why we can have scenes of Jiro contemplating how much lighter his planes would be if he didn't need to put guns into them, but still does it, you know. Yeah, that, that, that's one of the most revealing lines in the whole movie and, and an amazing little character bit, like him doing this like brief design sem seminar on how he got to the, uh, the zero design that they're going to be working on. And, he, and, and, and he's like, well, with, with, with this design, like I, I believe it could go up to like 280 knots and everyone's like, holy shit. And he's yeah. like... Uh, unfortunately, like the, there's going to be a problem with weight. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it'll, it'll be all right if we remove the guns. Yep. A brief pause, and everyone laughs, and he's like, "Well, so so I threw that design away." But it's like, yeah, that that's that's Jiro in a nutshell. He has this, uh, just th this this na naivete to him that goes throughout the movie. You see it also when when he's uh, he's in Germany with uh, with his friend. I, I forget his name. Um, to, for, for for like a, an an exchange thing uh, where, where they get to like uh, observe these like uh, giant metal planes uh, and the new technology the Germans are working with, um, and while uh, uh, while his friend is like complaining and and like talking talking about like uh, the w w who they're gonna be bombing with with, with those like uh, big machines, uh, Jiro is just like wandering off just to look at this little airplane that he just like finds like. Really fascinating. There's an there's an inno there's an innocence to his uh, fascination with uh, airspace engineering that uh, like that goes throughout the movie. And and he he is like he he has foils in the form of uh, of that friend who's like much more like cynical and and like aware that like oh, we're we're making weapons and we're trying to catch up and all that. Um, and also um, with uh, the uh, with with the uh, the German guy at the uh, uh, at the hotel. Uh, Co Co Cobera, what was his name? Kastob, yeah. yeah. Uh, Kastob, who, who, who also like looks him directly in the eye and says, you do realize the political situation, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I like great note there as well. Pick for the, the Disney dub, a uh, gold star, because they, uh, in turning it into they English, a, they had to lose a world-class uh, greatest of all time contender director with Hideo Kiano. So they replaced him with, they replaced and got another world class greatest full time director with a uh, Werner Herzog uh, uh, voicing Keltop, uh, the uh, the German guy. 
So, uh, good pick there. That is pretty yeah. beautiful, yeah. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to dig into a little bit more. One scene that I thought really characterized Jiro's relationship to the military and to the military use of his technology is when Jiro is still pretty new at the uh, uh, Mitsubishi uh, um, you know, facilities. And there's a scene where the military shows up to inspect the, 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 the work. But you see, and if you look carefully at that scene, that while the military shows up and it's like, yeah, let's let's see the results here. You have Jiro smile at the airplane doing its test flight currently with his back turned to the military people. Like he's not at all looking at the military people. He's just completely enamored by the airplane. And that basically says it all. Like he sort of willingly turns his back to these people so that he doesn't need to see what the real ramifications of these planes he's working on actually are. Yeah, the yeah. way the, the military brass are also depicted is like, uh, I can't remember the exact scene, but there's one that like in a boardroom meeting and all the military yeah. guys, they're like banging the table and acting like, the Navy. like children. And like, yeah, the Navy guys. And their eyes are like bulging out weirdly. They look like almost like inhumanly stupid as they're, they're like they're, demanding they're almost, fighter planes. Like it's a really weird, a grotesque cartoon depiction. Of they these look people. almost <laughs> like the, uh, the the three uh, rolling heads from a Spirit yeah, of the Way. Yeah, yeah, they do. They, they, they aren't even saying words. They literally are just being blah, 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 blah. There's there no yeah. words behind what they're saying because that's what Jiro's here. She's like, whatever, I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he just says, uh, I'll do my very best and like moves on to the next meeting where there's also like some military guys and, he, uh, and they say a lot and then he says, I'll do my very best and moves on. It, that's this yeah. like... There's this parody of like the uh, the, the military bureaucracy uh, in there. In a way, that kind of like inhuman human sounds is very similar to how violence in the film has been depicted up to this point, right? Um, so like the, the earthquake, so this kind of like this this kind of like this vocalized sound that doesn't have any meaning. Um, yeah, you know, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing, as a, a certain um, um, a bard said. Um, I think it's really yeah. interesting how um, the uh, um, we see repression of the reality behind these things happen in real time in diegetic yeah. diegesis in diegesis in this movie. It's that's uh, not often that you have this outside of a movie like I don't know fucking Jacob's Ladder or something. <laughs> um, uh, 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 another thing to point out is is like this uh, part of Jiro's arc during the course of the movie is like. Uh, it's subtle, but like it, 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 this naivete of his goes from something that's just like uh, a, quirk, a quirk of his personality to something that has to be willing. Um, yeah. the, he he gets like like uh, at like at the start of the movie he he gets to be this wide eyed idealist and uh, and he is throughout, but being confronted um, with like the military coming in and looking and he and he looks away. And you could say that, like, oh, he's looking away because he's just so, like, almost autistically fascinated by airplanes that he doesn't care. But later on, like, with the uh, with the influence of of, of Castor, with the um, with the, uh, uh, the 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 army uh, secret police, like, looking for him, um, he doesn't like really like at, at that point. There's no excuse of like, oh, I didn't realize. It, it, it's it's an active ignoring of like the implications of it. And uh, and yeah. it becomes a conversation he has with um, uh, in in his dream, and that that's where the line about the uh, like, would you rather live in a world with or without the pyramids comes in, which is but, a way of like, which sound like it's it's a really like terrible way of justifying uh, building yeah. things that uh, require literal slave labor because uh, uh, the the series were built using uh, Korean it, and Chinese it, slave labor. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's it's it, 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 it's interesting because right, um, um, um. There's, I don't think a, even a single mention of the Japanese colonies in this film. Um, and, 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 and it, it, it's interesting because you would usually think, okay, this film is just, you know, either the, you, my normal conclusion from hearing that would be like, oh, this film is just a you know piece of propaganda. Right. But, but it's interesting is um, <laughs> there is not very much the indication of the suffering of people in Japan either. The only times he ever sees violence is when he literally directly sees it in front of his face. Any other mention of violence, he just ignores, right? When Castor mentions like, oh, Germany and you and Japan are both going to blow up, he's just like, whatever. I don't, you know, that's not, that's not, that's not what's in front of me. The suffering he sees, like, he's, oh, he's, he's the suffering, he <laughs> sees the suffering of, of, of a couple of a couple kids. He sees the suffering of the person being pursued by the Gestapo in um um and in, in, when he's when he's in, when he's in Germany. And um, he sees the suffering of um, his wife. And that's all the suffering he sees post the earthquake. Like, he becomes even more 
quote unquote wide eyed idealized. He's he explicitly like 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 shelters himself away from any possible I- idea of violence happening anywhere because it besides in front of his face. And so the kind of like you know we see the you know the kind of the kind of like um kindness or quote unquote like oh I'm going to help the people in front of me that he displays in his childhood almost becomes this kind of like wheeling culpability right like he 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 he, yeah. he is that right and in that like you can get a little meta i think Miyazaki's extremely critical of himself here right i don't i don't i, I don't think this is a positive yeah, depiction i don't, I don't, like I, don't I, 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 the, think, uh, I think jiro's kind of positivity is just shown to be a farce as the film goes on um, yeah, and, i would and, say and there's, there's more nuance to it than that um for me, the pyramid line in particular ties a lot into the um, the the kind of other historical um, backdrops with um, the rise of fascism, not in just in Japan and Germany, but also key as well in Italy, which uh, Caproni is from as well. Where um, the line about the pyramids, to me, I don't know, um, maybe I'm being too charitable here, but I read it as it's like the the guy who say like designed the pyramids, whoever that dude was. He wasn't going to, like, somehow stop the massive, like, unbelievable amount of slavery in Egypt by not building the pyramids. Like, he Uh, was just the guy who had the design. It's a widespread myth that the pyramids were built on, on, like, the backs of, like, slave labor. Well, um, they were were much more slaves uh, in Egypt anyway, helping with it, like, but, you know. It was was, was, was built by paid farmers when when, when their fields were flooded. Um, Yeah, but yeah. They they even got, like, grave sites uh, near the pyramids. And and I think that's explicitly used here for that reason. I think it is trying to be a justification. It is very clearly a thin justification for the kind of it's kind of a thin justification, but again, it's it's more the nuance of like the the kind of like again the removed artist that doesn't have like much say, and it's kind of like the wallowing in that he doesn't have any say in it because again, it's like Miyazaki is feeling like the futileness of his own work, and Jiro his work being like a used for war, and he has really no say over it either way. Like the war was going to happen, and Japan was going to bomb a lot of people with or without him, and it's kind of just like this. Try, yeah, you're right. It's almost trying to justify that you didn't have anything to do with it, but also trying to say, well, like, at least I went for something beautiful in the end. Like, at least that's what I was going for. Yeah. I wasn't, uh, I mean, that's that's the best you can, like, really live with, I guess, in the end of it. Uh, the same for Caproni, who's seen as this, like, this constant dreamer, this constant guy trying to make, like, these stupidly bombastic, impossible to fly planes just for the sake of them. But in the end, his company helped manufacture like many bombers and warplanes for Italy's fascist government as well. Um, just just get, getting back to like uh, uh, Giro and his complicity um, over the course of the, mo- the movie, uh, he gets confronted over and over again by uh, by other characters and rarely ever like addresses it. Like yeah. there's a the, 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 there's a point early in the, in in his uh, career where where his friend is like. Uh, oh yeah, you see see all those like people starving out, out and, and the economic crisis, but uh, but here we are getting paid out the ass to uh, to get us into the air. Uh, like, w- look at the irony. And and he's saying this like very like sardonically with with, with a lot of cynicism. Yeah. And Jiro just just like sort of like passively uh, acknowledges it and like doesn't really it doesn't really affect his, his, his like worldview in any broader way. He doesn't like really take that into consideration later on it's it's just like a thing that we now know he would be aware of like like he he can't like just declare ignorance also later in the movie uh way later um when his uh when he's uh, his, his uh fiance well wife at that point is like very sick and at home and he's spending so much of his time working and his uh, his sister comes to visit and he completely forgot about that uh and, and comes home late and she's like chastising him like your your wife is like really sick like sicker than she she looks like she's putting on a brave face what the hell are you doing and uh, and and he's like well i mean uh, th- th- he has this need to uh, to work that just goes before everything else yeah and i think <laughs> I, I think the movie is actually pretty good at problematizing these yeah. things although it does not necessarily like get in under Jiro's skin at any point. So this, uh, this... I disagree. There's totally a scene where he's, like, um, working, but he's still kind of, like, um, he's visibly, like, distraught about his wife. Um, if I remember correctly, there's even a scene where he kind of, like, has tears, 
like in his eyes so, so he, as he's still kind of working through because it's almost like again this theme of like helplessness where his wife's ill but he doesn't know what to do he d- he doesn't have any other answers well he, he only knows how to like design planes that's all he's got so so, so yeah, maybe if he does like sign it well it. enough uh, he'll she'll yeah. get better so so yeah I, exactly like, i want to keep disagreeing with you and kind of continue tra- platon's train of thought because um the thing is that it is unclear to us if Naoko would have gotten better if she stayed at the sanatorium. We need to, however, keep in mind that the decision that why she ran away from the you know sanatorium where she was supposed to get healthy was so she could be with Jiro. And they also married in a very quick and ill-considered way um, because you know they wanted to live the marriage very briefly, intensively, have this proximity to each other because Jiro was not willing to give up working on his airplanes because he said it. If he wanted to go with her to the sanatorium to be together, he would have to give up the airplanes. He was not willing to give up the airplanes and Naoko was fine dying for it. Which is a very important point. This is explicitly the decision that Naoko joins yeah. him in making. And he also says it, please don't go back. He wants her to stay, and they both know what that means. That means he will keep working and she will die because she will not recover from this. And yeah, this or is, at least die quicker than she would have if, if she had like adequate medical care. And this is this is one of those things where I have a very central point to my reading. It comes from this very uh, uh, link between Jiro working on these destructive and terrible airplanes that will be used for f- very bad things in war. And his wife and him deciding to live such a marriage that she will die young, even though, uh, because Jiro couldn't abandon this work. Because, you know, we could be, and I think we should maybe think of Jiro as kind of a bad dude, by, because his notion of living, which is to, you know, make up these moral justifications for building airplanes along the lines of, if I wouldn't have built them, then nobody would have built them. Uh, sorry, other way around. If I wouldn't have built them, then someone else would have built them, and this is why I will and, and make not my as well yeah. as I would. The point being that his dream couldn't have been realized if he hadn't done it like this. Si- same with the marriage, right? So they could have decided to send her to the sanatorium. He could have decided to stop building airplanes and go with her there. They decided against that because he wanted to have it all. And this is, I think, a very purposeful critical lens on the character of Jiro because, and this is one thing that isn't mentioned in the movie, but is really important for the historical backdrop that we're engaging this film with. The airplanes that Jiro designs were the kamikaze uh, airplanes. The uh, Mitsubishi A6M, uh, I think is, is the number. The airplanes that later on in the war would turn into literal blazes of glory instead of you know, slowly fading out. I say glory, of course, in uh, quotation marks, because obviously kamikaze is like one of the most terrible things we can imagine as a result of like fascistic ideology, brain rotting their, uh, uh, or not brain rotting, like wasting their own, you know, young pilots and soldiers well, to just let to be, them to, crash into to, to, the to enemy. To be clear, um, most kamikaze pilots were not young. They sent their, like, elderly there there's people who weren't very good at flying this is at the end of the war when they were like let's just like just blow everything up you know kind of thing it was like when fascism you know, was like um said, or did this kind of thing and most kamikaze yeah. pilots were not really willing they were basically like forced like you're you're gonna do this you're, Def- they definitely took, they took, definitely they took, like middle-aged old people who yeah. couldn't fight anymore couldn't do anything else and who weren't very good pilots and said fly to the enemy but what um, i'm trying to get at is when i talk it's about still a symbol of yeah, fascist ideology when i talk this is what I realized when I tried to write out what I think the theming of this movie is about. When we consider what is the reason for why Jiro wants to keep working on his airplanes and refuses or rather doesn't want his sick wife to go back to the sanatorium and doesn't want to stop working for her to go with her. The reason is he wants his life to be lived intensively in a blaze rather than to slowly fade away. And when writing this thematic point, I noticed that wow, this thing, this whole idea of going out in a blaze rather than slowly withering away is deeply problematic in the context of kamikaze because kamikaze because that's like sort of the symbolic logic of what kamikaze is. Instead of accepting oh, surrender, a- accepting defeat, you throw yourself into an explosion where you will literally die for your country. It also plays into the uh, line uh, about like, uh, you know, uh, like any art, any artist has like 10 years of good work. 
and then uh, like that, that that becomes like a a, a timer that Jiro like genuinely seem genuinely seems to believe in. Yeah, like, which is a very interesting thing years. if we're to look at the movie bio, um, this, um, biographically as well, considering Miyazaki's creative period is this existed for about 40 years straight of being like the best in his entire industry yeah it's um, really weird like what, what, so Miyazaki when were your 10 years <laughs> well yeah I think that's maybe like the parallel he's drawing to Jiro where like you're right I, I do I do agree that Jiro does kind of have this mentality that he's just trying to like keep going and when I when I say he doesn't know how to help uh sure like he actually could have gone with his wife to the sanatorium but I'm just saying like you know, like the character himself, he wouldn't like consider that an option. You're right, like because he can only know to like to to work on his plans to like power through. Yeah, uh, and the, um, the the ten years of of work. I wonder if that's um, again connected to Miyazaki. I wonder if that's kind of a a thing maybe he wishes was true because it's like we say, like Miyazaki says, you know, I don't particularly enjoy making films. It's painful, and we see him go through all these like drawn out processes of like an angsting over so many choices but in the end he keeps working and uh very poignantly at the at the very end of kingdoms of dream and madness they have a big press conference where miyazaki announces his retirement and there's a massive uh pool like, of journalists and people taking photos and suzuki's there beside him and his uh, um, retirement notice is i will retire in 10 years so even yeah, then I, he I, says I i'm gonna keep going like yeah, yeah like, but that's what he wrote down for his yeah. note for his notes. Yeah. Um, but, so even when he wants to retire, he says, "I'm still yeah going to keep just going. Like I'm not going to stop because like Miyazaki, he doesn't know else to, what else to do with himself. Like yeah, yeah. But speaking of, of Kamikaze, I want I want to focus on that because Kamikaze is like really like kind of a core, maybe the the, the core image of after, after after like the atomic bombs of like you know how. Japanese people and people around the world think about Japan and their kind of presence during the war, right? Like, 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 um, I, I, one of the, one of the, like, 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 one of the core, like, um, 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 um like ideas of, of in the war memory in Japan was just like taking these kamikaze, you know, fighters and being like, this is what it meant to be Japanese. Like these people represented Japan, you know, the best. These, these, these people died in a blaze of glory. These people, you know, did all these things, right? Like the, like, and specifically, it's really important to note that these people that the, the narrative always sold them not as dying for their emperor because the emperor was kind of thrown out of like the the, the 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 idea, but rather as dying for their community and dying for their family, um, not dying for the military, not dying for the emperor. Those two things were were very not 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 ever sold as part of the narrative because those things were you know the, the chance that these are the bad guys, the military and the emperor, and we, we but, but the Japanese people were were, 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 were were good, cool people, and we're just these, these deaths may have been futile, but they were at least beautiful. You know, like that, that kind of that that kind of like idea of the kamikaze. Um, and um, yeah, and and it was like this kind of um, how do you say it? like like people really were into like movies about kamikaze pilots and manga. There's so much manga about kamikaze pilots in the fifties and sixties. Um, and like this cool like like this whole like, idea of like like they they love this. And there was this kind of this kind of like almost like a. Um, I, I've heard one person describe it as the nation vicariously dying through the death of the kamikazes, right? Where like they could properly have their like because J- Japan saw that the, as, a, as a country they they wanted to find some way of um, where they felt closure to the war, where they didn't feel like they were they 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 they, they presented them as victims, but they wanted to present them as a kind of heroic victims, the kind of people like oh look, we lived our we fought them the best we could, but now our country is dead, our now our empire of Japan is dead, right? That that kind of thing, and it's like it's it's um interesting because in regards to this film, because um this whole this whole kind of long history of like um of like the obsession with kamikaze is because like even in like like in the nineties when films there's a there's a film from the nineties um called um. Um, 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 the winds of God. Um, 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 well, I guess the English translation. I guess Kamikaze would just be the. It would just be called Kamikaze. Um, but um, and it's about these, 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 basically these kids who are the kids, like people like our age, kids, but um, who um slip back, you know, into the forties and they become Kamikaze pilots. And the only way they're able to return to the modern time is to die as Kamikaze pilots. Which then returns them to the modern times. So this kind of that's pretty obs- fucked. Obs- yeah, this obsession over dying, having the Kamikaze pilots die for the sake of people being able to move on from the war. That's kind of like this kind of like big narrative arc in, in a lot of Japanese war m- war memory like histories. Yeah. Um, and it, it's interesting um, specifically is um how people who Kamikaze pilots who did not die during the war um 
were basically shamed as a pariah people, right? It was like they, 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 there was there was tons of stories written about their moral degeneracy, all their like their, their how you know they were always called gay and like you know all these these kinds of things, right? They were they were they were basically, basically were assaulted by you know people, and they kind of had to like they, they, they you, you 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 didn't tell people you were a kamikaze pilot because like survive kamikaze pilot was like the ultimate shame, right? Because you've because you've you've ruined the narrative, right? Why didn't you die? Why didn't you? cleanse our country why 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 are you here you were reminding me of the fact that we did horrible things during this war and we made these people do these things right instead of dying the death of a proper kamikaze um and i and i think that I mean, in regards to this film in regards to jiro jiro is a kamikaze pilot um I, no question in the very beginning of the film he wanted to be a kamikaze pilot he wanted to go be a pilot um <laughs> But he was unable to because he couldn't see. Well, no, not necess- he did not no, necessarily no, 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 want to no, die. No, the Kamikaze pilot, but that is what he wanted to be. That's why he wants to die in 10 years. He wanted to blaze out in glory. He wanted to do the beautiful thing and then disappear. He wanted to be a firefly. As, oh, that, that, that's, yes. that, that's um, a fair reading. Um, yeah, um, and, 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 I, and I think that this kind of thing, the people around him are the people who are dying, the people who fly his planes, his wife, you know, um, the people who he doesn't look at, right? These people who he sees as these kind of beautiful figures, but kind of turns his head away as they kind of pass away. Like his wife, when his wife leaves, he doesn't get to see her cure die. He never gets to see his planes disappear either. Um, but he, he knows that they're happening, right? There's a scene where when his, when his, when, when, when Naoko dies, um, um, he kind of, he kind of look, he's, he's seeing his planes being tested. And he looks into the distance and he definitely like realizes in that moment, oh, she's died. Right. I, I, um, I, I, I really want to talk about that specific scene because yeah. that's something that Nya talked about earlier, how like this, this mutual decision of theirs that like, uh, that, that, that there's, there's so much importance put uh, into his work and into making this mark on history, making this beautiful plane. And, yeah. uh, and, and even his wife is like, uh, like agree that like, it's so important to him and because she loves him, it's important to her too. And so they 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 make this decision, and it's that there's some beauty in it, um, some some like tragic uh, beauty, sac- self sacrifice for the sake of art. But that scene you're talking about, Thundi, I I believe like completely turns that on its head, yeah. because just in the moment of victory, in the moment of triumph, where the zero ha- is it, it absolutely works and just stuns everybody with its speed and its stunning control and all that, just as as, as it lands. Uh, a, a gust of wind arrives and he looks away. He looks towards yeah. uh, Naoko, who uh, he feels has died. And this this uh, is not a vi- real victory. There, there's no real triumph in that moment. Even as everyone is celebrating and the pilot goes up and says straight up, she, uh, she flies like a dream. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> yeah. Very on the nose there, uh, Miyazaki. Uh, but... Okay, fair. Um, he like there's no like sense of like fulfillment. Was it yeah. worth it? Is the big question at the very yeah, end. And, that and I believe one, the answer is no. Yeah, because that one hundred percent ties into the uh, the ending sequence of the movie. That is that is like this uh, the final dream part where all the zeros we see they go off and fly. And of course, there's the line that not a single one returned. Yeah. Um, also, also and, a, a shot that like uh, yeah, the, the is, mirrors the an echo, an echo of Poker, yeah, Poker the, 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 the plane uh, graveyard yeah. flying forever, um, and then of course the, the the final like important part that Miyazaki like changed at the last moment where he sees like this kind of heavenly ghostly figure of Naoko on this kind of you know Elysian field uh, calling to him, but she used to she originally in the script she said uh, like you know come join me or or something Just like that. Come. Yeah, okay. but but then he changed it to "you must live, like live," because I think yeah, the ending part is that there's all this kamikaze reference and like symbolism, and even Naoko herself is kind of a kamikaze in a in a in a thematic sense. But yeah. like at the end of the story, Jiro is still alive. Jiro still has to live. Like he he didn't get to die in the war, and it was never shown as like a there were these blazing, brilliant, glorious deaths. They were just off somewhere else. Like he threw out his planes into the into the wind, and then they never came back. And he has to keep yeah. on living after that that has happened. Like so there the can't airplanes. be like this. There's yeah. There's there's there is no um. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, closure. There's no like mm. big final yeah. moment. There's no like big death that like yeah. sends like, it, it soaring. It's, it's a very it's like open a, ending, yeah. uh, mm. which is like but really what, fascinating. What you're getting really? at is also really core to some of so two of the big criticisms that really can be levied against this movie um, is really 
present already in what you just said. You say the planes and Naoko, basically Jiro's two love stories. You know, he has two love stories <laughs> in this movie, the planes and Naoko. Both of them disappear to die. They go off screen, so we and Jiro as well retain their beautiful image in our mind. So for one thing, this has caused criticism of, is this whitewashing um, J Japanese responsibility in the war, Jiro's responsibility for things that happened in the war, where we simply emphasize the beauty, the technological superiority, and the dream of the airplanes while actually in the movie leaving out all the victims they caused, kamikaze as a fact that has been associated with these planes, as well as, you know, the Koreans, uh, the, the, the col colonialism involved in all of this. We leave this out. But simultaneously, we also kind of forget about the fact, and this is, maybe you get to this later, but there has been a lot of feminist criticism of this movie from the angle of how Naoko in this entire work functions only as a symbol of transient beauty and how um, Jiro's love to her is really only to be understood through the very fact that until the end she remains beautiful until she disappears to crash and burn in quotation marks, you know what I mean? The notion that she had to disappear because the only way we can narratively understand uh, Jiro's love to Naoko is through her beauty and her transience. And yeah. both of these things to me are actually really strong and important criticisms of this movie that have to be dealt with if we try, yeah. if we want to understand it. Um, I, I think that we should deal with the, um, the latter one first because we haven't talked at all about the, um, the famous um, scene, you know, really at the, um, at, 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 the, the, at, at Naoko's summer house. Yeah. We have the, the completely left um, out Magic Mountain so far. We we should, yeah, we should yeah. we can talk about that. Um, I actually wanted to briefly reference uh, something in kind of a, a quick contrast. Um, I didn't get the time to watch the whole movie, but I thought it'd be an interesting thing while we're still on the topics of the Kamikaze pilots. Um, interestingly enough, another movie about the Z Mitsubishi Zero came out in 2013 called uh, The Eternal Zero. That was the second highest grossing film of the year, Beneath the Wind Rises. <laughs> well... Wow. Um, <laughs> There was uh it's a I didn't get to watch the movie as I said, but um from what I understand the movie is about um two like um kind of like twenty year olds discovering their uh, granddad was actually a kamikaze pilot who died in the war and it's like they, they go on this big journey to find out the history about it. And um uh, Shinzo Abe apparently loves this movie and said it was amazing and beautiful, which uh, I think tells you a lot already. <laughs> Uh, considering he's one of the big, big, big politicians that tried to push reforming Japan's um, uh, the mil what was the military like Article Seventeen Article or Nine of the yeah, Constitution. We'll, 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 we'll get to that when talking about the uh, uh, the, the criticism of, of of the war angle. Uh, yeah, but uh, so but anyway, Shinzo Abe said the movie was great, but then M Miyazaki himself said that the movie was um, where is it? Um, what's the quote here? Trying to make the Zero Fighter um, story based on a fictional account that was a pack of lies or just continuing a phony myth and the sort of uh, thing he'd heard of since a kid. So it's funny that Miyazaki made a movie that was also uh, an incredibly fictional version of history, but calling this movie like a pack of lies and like phony because um, from what I can understand of the movie, it it does that angle, uh, like you were saying, uh, Thunder, where it's like, it's it's the the kamikaze pilot character. He's he's not he's not doing it for like glor for the glory of the country, but he's kind of doing it in this way that's like it's a man's way to go out. Like he he was forced into doing it, but he did it with gumption, even though it was against you know what he wanted. And it's kind of like a glorious. I believe the last scene of the movie is him just like plowing in and then a fade to white. So it's kind of a movie. Of, going in the exact opposite of what The Wind Rising is kind of doing with this uh, thematic uh, point at the end. And I guess it's pretty telling also that there was the second highest movie <laughs> in, in the year, so like there's still that sentiment. Yeah, that, that's, like, really, re that's really interesting. All right. Um, at this point, before we transition into talking about the huge summer residence uh, uh, sequence and more about the romance, I think, I want to sort of really put the question of how this movie deals with war, war responsibility into the room and just ask broadly how each of you feels about how this movie deals, I guess, with this memory. Is it whitewashing? Is it glorifying the airplanes? Is it doing a, let's say, responsible job? Or what do you think is it, is it really doing with the war memory? So I 
like I said earlier, I think this is like a very challenging movie. Uh, on b- both from a like creative standpoint, making it, and from an audience standpoint, and uh, it's dealing with these like really, really harsh and uh, and like culturally significant and uh, contested issues uh, in in Japan at, at the very least, um, and it's doing it with subtlety and with a se- with a sense of like dramatic tragic irony, which is. Uh, very, uh, I I, th- I think it succeeds, but I also understand how um, it's it's tricky because when you make movies like that, you run the risk of people like n- seeing it at face value or not catching the subtleties, and uh, and 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 those subtleties being uh, be- becoming an argument, like whether those subtleties indicate the, what the movie is actually saying or whether like there's an argument to be made that the movie is saying the uh, the more on its face thing more. Um, like a, a, a big key example would be like uh, David Fincher's Fight Club, how people like watched that movie and then went on to found their own fight clubs as though the mm. movie wasn't like completely satirical about that hyper-masculinity. And then people just unironically loved it uh, because it was masculine in that way. That's that's a challenge that uh, that's any artist uh n- needs to confront but especially film because uh film so much of the communication of film is um is, is very direct and visceral uh through the way it frames things not necessarily the ways in which it directly talks about them so that there, there's there's definitely um there's definitely subtlety and the movie i believe is um is anti-war. It's really saddened by this whole thing. The the looming threat of war is uh, is part of the tragedy of the movie, um, and and Jiro's naivete, willing naivete, is part of the tragedy of his character, and and that all comes together in the ending, connecting it with the tragedy of his uh, the loss of his uh, his loved one. Um, but uh, this. Um, uh, how, how, how do I put this? Um, uh, however, there's also a reason why I, I believe it was the Japan Times um, praised the movie for its um, its like v- v- very um, uh, nostalgic and uh, and po- like and uh, and wistful depiction of uh, of an, uh, a more innocent pre-war Japan, uh, as though the, the because the movie really frames it nostalgically. This this era and uh, and and there's this uh, while this the score especially is is like definitely uh, tragic. It also has this wistful quality, and we see this. Um, th- th- there is also this sense that uh, that Japan is on the back foot uh, and and actually has reason to resent the rest of the world for like keeping them technologically uh, like behind. Um, and then there are all these elements of the movie that do like sort of confirm or, or at least not challenge these presumptions about uh, about Japan during the war. Um, there's um, there's a really there's a well written and, and passionate uh, article from uh, a Chinese American film critic uh, Inku Kang. Um, she she writes uh, for the Village Voice uh, an article called uh, "The Trouble with the Wind Rises," um, and she makes a pretty cogent argument that. Miyazaki uh, making this movie in the cultural context he does, which is Japan in the 21st century, um, a country which like politically has not recognized the atrocities of, of World War II, at least not to the extent that like taking responsibility for it in any broader sense. And so she argues that Miyazaki by necessity has to be very subtle about his critique or, or as she puts it, like uh, pussyfooting around. Essentially, mm. um, which like is understandable from that context, but that does not mean that a we- Western viewer should be accepting of the way it frames things. Um, she points out how it subtly depicts uh, Japan and the Japanese people as victims of the war. That the looming war is something like, like we mentioned earlier. The uh, the first dream sequence, the uh, the Zeppelin with the Iron Cross on it. Uh, Germany uh, is is coming. Uh, and, and, and like the alliance with Germany being like something seemingly like 
unwilling on the, on, on, on their part. And, and this little bit of like Germans being racist towards the Japanese. Um, and, uh, and, and like the few depictions of, um, of war violence is of like Japanese planes being destroyed by Chinese uh, planes. While there's not a single like depiction of the Japanese committing uh, acts of war, that but that becomes something that's like uh, off in off in the dream world, like they're, they're they're going off. And while that of course plays into these subtleties, it's also like viscerally, it doesn't really address the um, the atrocities committed by the uh, the Japanese, the uh, the complicity of the Japanese people and industries in it, um, and it it. It absolutely does not uh, address like the atrocities and or like we said, for example, the slave labor needed to um, to build the zeros that that uh, Jiro designed, and Jiro is never held accountable to that extent. Um, she she also writes, and and I think this is a really interesting point that's uh, that we we should actually discuss. Uh, I'm, I'm quoting directly here. It's hard to believe that where the wind rises set in an interworld Germany and focused on an idealistic dreamer who just wanted to design the world's most beautiful U-boat and didn't care a whit about the concentration camps, it would receive a similarly adoring reception in the US. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a really cogent criticism that, that needs to be dealt with. Um, I, I don't know how, how, uh, how you all uh, feel about that. Um, I don't know, maybe just me, but I could definitely see myself enjoying a movie about the design of the U-boat. In fact, <laughs> no... Um, like vaguely tangentially related, um, quite an interesting movie about U boats is uh, Das Boot, uh, that is like about kind of how all the guys at sea didn't give a shit about Nazi Germany and they make fun of the Hitler Youth guy for being a fucking stuck up fascist. But you know, that's just a weird example I thought of. Yeah, but that movie also has um, a pretty conflicted reception in terms of how yeah, people I, I, I interpret so. it as um, dealing with war. Yeah. Uh, I, I think the um, I think the Wind Rises isn't as like whitewashing as that article makes it out because I read it also um particularly with it's like kind of there's there's so much like miyazaki class cynicism about uh, japan in the movie like all the characters in the movie that jiro talks to are incredibly like cynical about their jobs and about like the the role of japan like his uh his friend who he goes to a university with talks about how japan is just a poor country trying to like you know, like uh, rapidly make itself modern and sell planes and weapons to other countries just to get somewhere in the world. Um, when Jiro gets hunted by the uh, secret police, there's a there's a fantastic line that's like pure Miyazaki, where um, uh, Jiro goes, "Can you believe that this is happening in a modern country?" And then his boss goes, "You think Japan is a modern country?" <laughs> like, I think yeah, that's like the, like the, the, the most telling of the the view of like Japan, like really trying to like. A play bigger and like be more important than it really is or than like um like we said there was also the contrast between the uh, the traditional buildings and the rebuilt tokyo as well or i think there's this real kind of like disgust for the uh the the, the fascist um industrialization that uh just kind of thoughtlessly kept plowing through and uh, like kind of almost left uh, the Japanese behind, which I guess you could say is kind of whitewashing because I can't disagree that the film is part of a larger like context of how Japan uh, views itself. And like you could say Miyazaki has to make his criticism subtle, but I really think it's one of those things where it's like, I don't know if Miyazaki is, in, is inherently like obligated to make criticisms about war crimes in his movie, like the article kind of suggests, because I do feel like it does intentionally become very narrow in being about Jiro and Jiro's perspective, a man who never really saw any warfare, at least in the story, the way it frames it, that he just like made the planes and he never saw them again. And his kind of incredibly like isolated view of not just the planes in the war, but of like everything else around him. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, I think it's a bit much to say like, Oh, the movie is like denying war crimes or it's like trying to ignore them. When I think the movie isn't really trying to say anything about the war crimes of the Japanese, per instance, and it's kind of more of a guilt by association, uh, because of like again, you see movies like The Eternal Zero come out in the same year and receive a lot of <laughs> positive reception. So you know, I can't deny that maybe Miyazaki could have been a bit more forthright about his opinions. 
uh, uh, but, uh, to the public. I, th- in, 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 I think. In, in, um, in, oh, yeah. Go ahead. To be clear, the conservative people in Japan did not like the Wind Riders. It was uh, um, it was it was, it was g- generally criticized by the conservative audience by not, by not glorif- anti-Japanese. Yeah, be anti anti yeah, that, 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 yeah. not not glorifying Japan's you know past and and I also just think that say the fact that it doesn't show colonialization. It's not because the film is I ex- a explicitly trying to not show exploitation or b trying to uh, just ignoring it. It's because Jiro does not see, and the film is intensely subjected to Jiro's perspective. I think the film yes. is very much a a war memory film that is try again. How do I say this? It's a a war memory film built around kind of a modern person's perspective of what they might. Try. That's not the way. Right, right, right. It's 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 it's, it's Miyazaki talking about himself. It's Miyazaki saying, "Look at look, look, this. This is how I see the world. I know it's wrong. I know that things are wrong. I know the pyramids are wrong. Right. I know. I know this. What's this way of approaching things is not correct. I know these are flimsy justifications I use for the things I do. And I know that I don't see the suffering outside of what's just directly in front of my face. And even stuff I directly in front of my face, I don't actually address well enough. Um, I, I'm, I'm yeah. aware of that, but like. Absolutely, I, like and I, b- b- building, you know, so, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's all, the, all the character can say. They don't, they don't know any other way. I, I think b- build, building thing. off of that idea, I, th- I think, um, I, I think it goes beyond just uh, the the autobiographical angle, which we've uh, we've talked about uh, a lot already. Um, like going beyond that, um, what I think, like personally, like, like I, I talked a lot about like the complexities and the the criticism which which should be like uh, addressed um but i i personally see this as um like you said it's very very subjective from jiro's perspective and that perspective was chosen for a specific reason it's uh miyasaki is a humanist to his core so looking at the um at, at this uh at, at, at this period of time, looking at the way in which his father and his uncle were somewhat complicit, but still like doing it to survive, to to, to keep living, to keep their family fed, um, and still had this kindness in them, um, he looks at that complicated feeling, combines it with his complicated feeling with the beauty of airplanes and the horrors of war, um, and picks this character to uh, whom he can relate to on a personal level. He has this personal understanding with Jiro of like being this obsessive craftsman in a, like working with something that might in the end not have the amount of meaning that uh, that that corresponds with how much work you put into it. He's also sacrificed a lot for making uh, entertainment for others, essentially. Like, yes, it is art, but he is like part of this industry that he clearly like despises in many ways. Um, and so like what, what, what the movie really is, is just a very, like an artist finding a human angle on a very morally fraught, uh, like period, a morally fraught character and exploring it with, uh, with an empathy that sort of like, uh, to some people, um, and, and and understandably so, like verges on endorsement, v- v- verges on like being too sympathetic, yeah. and and it, it, and, it, and, and that that that's like I, I think that there is actually actually like a good argument to say that, well, of course you can make art about it, everything, anything you'd like, and and then this movie is well made and all, uh, but if you're one of the people who think that like no, actually, uh, the Japanese Empire leading up to during World War Two. Is simply too serious, too culturally fraught a subject to approach from this level of empathy and nuance that that there needs to be more uh, con- condemnation. I think that's a fair view to have, even if I I might disagree yeah. with it. I, I, I also think from this perspective, right? In if you look at the history of how remembrance of World War II has gone, there's a really Big, there, 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 there are a few elements that are really important to how, how, how these say, these movies and manga and things that depict like Japan and the war usually go. And A, they share they, 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 a few ways. First of all, they depict usually um, very domestic figures, mothers and daughters and wives, right? And specifically, it, it, it depict, depicts them in regards to their kind of 
you know, mourning for their 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 dead um their dead male relatives and their kind of like their work their work woman attitude in about bringing up Japan like lifting up Japan. They do B. They depict people suffering. They depict Japanese people suffering. There are lots and lots and lots of Japanese people suffering all the time. Right? If you watch anything, any fiction of World War II in Japan from like the fifties through the nineties, it's just it's just it's it's just it's just it's just suffering porn. Um, you just you just see these poor emaciated Japanese people, and they're all like not doing great and that kind of thing. And the third thing is, kamikaze pilots are displayed heroically. You show them in their death. You show them in their beauty. You show these kinds of things. They're not things you look away from. You look towards them because you want to celebrate their death. These three things are all taken out of the film. None of those things exist in this film. Um, and I think it's really important to note that while we don't show the specific, you know, colonial images or violence, and then you can perhaps make it even a criticism that like the one time we see planes, the heroes fighting, they fight Japanese, Chinese planes, the Chinese planes used to be shooting them down. So it's like, okay, babe, oh, is that kind of like a weird criticism? I don't know. But generally, these usual depictions of um, Japanese nationalism and Japanese kind of nostalgia and sentimentality for the war and the kind of that, that kind of toxic war memory that leads to Japan to conceiving itself as purely as a victim and not as a as anything else. You know, so oh, the 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 the, the Americans and the Japanese um, government both worked to both, both and Germany all were like fighting the Japanese people who were the real heroes. You know, that those kind of images are not there. So I'm suspicious of a claim that the film is. You can say the film doesn't adequately address these issues, but to say the film does any, but say the film um, is destructive to the issues, I feel like would be a mistake because of the lack of these kind of traditional tropes of, you know, Japanese war memory, you know, tropes around hmm. um, how things, how the nationalistic members of World War II. And I guess to add onto that and give my own take on this matter, uh, for me, it is kind of clear that this film is to be read as a pacifist message. So the core conflict in terms of moral themes is that something as beautiful as planes has to be loaded with a machine gun, has to be loaded with bombs, has to be turned into a weapon of war. So in the same vein as Miyazaki gives us a sad, tragic note that this should really not be the case, we should really be pacifistic because then we can have technology be used in beautiful ways. He also uh, keeps... Um, I lost my point, but um, hold yeah, on. Like, let me, let an me find an it. An ongoing yeah. motif in the movie is this: like uh, uh, b- both um, uh, b- both both Jiro and uh, his imaginary friend, Cap- what, fucking Cap- Cap- Capri- Caproni, Cap- Caproni. Thank you, uh, Caproni. Um, ha- have this thing going on where they're like, um, ah, th- it's su- such a shame that this is going to be used for uh, like. Uh, like let let's see how many passengers we can get on. That that that's the goal. The goal is to get people and fly them around and yeah. uh, and and have this wonder in the world. And there's obviously the um the German like the gigantic bomber that uh that, that they see that at that point hasn't been converted into a bomber yet. It's still like um a luxury passenger experience. So, uh, but of course yeah. would be retrofitted i guess it's, it's an um, ongoing thing one one historical note that that, that I, I picked out in particular that kind of um it's not said in the movie but it's kind of like added to the part of like the tragedy of like this whole situation particularly with caproni is um at some point they turned uh the the ca4 bomber into the ca48 commercial airliner uh in like the 20s i think and they, they, yeah, they converted all these old uh, useless bomber planes into like civilian transports. But then, like one of them, like crashed in like one of the worst air disasters in Italian history, mm-hmm. and that would have like already happened by like the the time like the film is set. So it's like Caproni, even though he's like history and he'd already have built bombers as well, is already mired in like a lot of like death, like a lot of like his planes uh, leading to just pure tragedy. He still like keeps this um um this kind of jovial spirit up. And even though he's kind of like, you know, it's not the real Caproni, it's like Jiro imagining him. He still idealizes him because even though he's, he, Jiro would know all of this tragic stuff had happened, um, he still kind of sees Caproni as a guy who just keeps going, who like he's still trying to make the most in like impossible planes fly. As Yeah, he's kind of like guardian, his kind of spirit of uh, uh, imagination. You know, I I kind of started thinking maybe the thought 
uh, make sense if we develop it a little bit. Um, I think the movie doesn't really ask us to forgive people. It simply asks us to change our view on technology, basically to forgive that the beautiful airplanes were used for cruel things. Hmm. I think what Miyazaki hmm. yeah. seeks to cause in us is to reflect or think about technology in a different way, one which is not tainted by the reality of war. Yeah, there's a there's a really no, great, I, I, great I, I quote disagree. from Miyazaki I, I, talking about the zero, where he um he said I think like the zero in a, in in a, this humiliating history the zero is the one thing we could be proud of they were truly fearsome and in that I think he he's, he literally is referring to the zero itself not like the kamikaze pilots of fighting in the war he literally ref- is referring to the plane itself is this beautiful fearsome thing that got made. And that, like he, he can't stop thinking about. And you're right; he's kind of just wants to make this whole movie almost apologizing for what was ha- done with the zero to an extent by showing you that it was like a beautiful thing at one point. It was this like paper airplane that uh, Jiro had in his mind, and he threw it into the world. And I really think that symbolism is 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 a, is a real important part. Like I said, where he throws the airplane in his dreams, and then in the final sequence where we see the planes like lifting off, like. They're going away from him. They're out of his control, and they they go on to like die and cause destruction and be a part of a horrible war. But like Jiro is just there watching them fly away the whole time. Yeah, uh, honestly, I, I, I think this this reading that it's like a pol- uh, apologism for the zero itself, or, or like for um, like uh, I I I don't think I I don't, I don't agree with that reading. I think uh, I, I I think it's much more critical. I think it lands uh, on a much more somber note um, than uh, than that. Uh, it's it, it's it's not like um, it does. It doesn't really. I don't feel like it celebrates this the the, the zero. It specifically undercuts any celebration of the invention. It, um, it, it, it celebrates the creative it spirit it without celebrating its outcome. Again, kind of like we say with the 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 same thing with Naoko. Like it's it's tragic and like heartbreaking that she dies. But like it's at the same time there was like a love there. There was like a human emotion. And kind of I guess if we're if we're bordering towards the more existential parts of the the, the story, it is, you know, that's life itself. It's fleeting and it's uh, pretty tragic most of the time. But like when it's beautiful, it's very beautiful. And also well, I want to say that I, the movie just... the particularly the last line of the movie, because it's it's not just that she says you must live, but like at the very end he's like walking down the meadow in his dream. He's, and like Caproni says, like come to my house. My family's going to be there for dinner. And obviously, this is a dream, but it's still almost like this weirdly positive thing to end on. That like Jiro is going to go keep on living, and he's going to keep on like, uh, you know, having more dreams. And Caproni, his kind of spirit guide, is always going to be there with him. This this spirit of imagination, because yeah, you know, Jiro, I, the real Jiro I, I, I Hikoshi believe- didn't stop designing planes after the Zero. He kept yeah. going. Like. I, I do believe that the film is celebrating that creative spirit without celebrating its outcome and actually lamenting uh, its its, yeah, its yeah, outcome. Yeah. And, and I think that that um, of, of course the, the the parallel between the uh, the love of uh, Jiro and Nanako and and his love of airplanes and, and the zero is there. But I th- I do think that it's really deeply undercut by that scene uh, where the zero is flying and he's looking towards Nanako. That's that's a really poignant and important moment in which the difference between the two is is, is like made clear. So that these the uh, triumph of the zero is not that important, and then that realization comes too late, and that's part of the tragedy of it all. Yeah, there, there's also Miyazaki talking about how he, he even like late in the production of the film, he still startled with the ending and the morality of the film. That he at that at that ending point really realized the 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 that he had trouble finding Jiro's feelings in the face of the paradox of his dream of wanting to create a plane which in the end will turn out to be a war plane. And I'm quoting here from an article where I copied this from. Um, He also concluded that the Zero managing to fly is not necessarily an appropriate end for the film. And he always asked the same question. Jiro is building a war war plane. What What final should we write? What finale would be satisfying here? And what I find interesting here is, yeah, Platon, you are right. The zero managing to fly by the end is not the celebrated thing. It is not the finale. That is not it, right? And here I think I finally synthesized something which makes more sense to me. Because 
Yesterday, I think in this, in our podcast chat, I posted the question of me not really being able to reconcile the themes of Wind Rises with Laputa, where in Laputa, we have this really beautiful, magical castle, this island in the, fl in the sky that's really uh, breathtaking. But we know as humans, we have to let it get away. We have to let it fly. Because if we had it, it would ruin us. And to me, this said something about technology. And we talked about this in that podcast, right? Like the idea that this technology is in some way uh, cursed, inherently ruinous. And even though it is beautiful, we cannot have it. In a way, I, I sort of feel like we've actually come around to it. While despite Jiro managing to build the Zero and completing his work on it, what is being painfully brought into our uh, memory again is the curse of the technology that inherently leads to it being misused and Miyazaki really wanting us to conceive of a fantasy world that is like Caproni's airplanes, these beautiful things where tons of people are having fun and frolicking around and, and they become communal spaces and they you know, in, in those dream sequences, all these airplanes are just wonderful, magnificent, uh, you know, beautiful places, which they, in reality, neither for Caproni nor for Jiro could be. So really, again, I think in a way, the Zeros flying away to never return is the castle in Laputa flying away to never return. Because, you know, we as humans are not able to handle this kind of technology in a way that really has its beauty mean anything to us in the face of what we will inevitably end up using it for yeah i i, I agree it's, it's interesting how it like builds on on this theme of like uh the way in which t uh, technology aff aff affects us and, and curse knowledge and all that but taking it from like a fantasy world from like future boy conan or uh, laputa and uh and putting it into the real world um another th but another way it's, it's also like reminiscent of is obviously poco rosso which is also uh, not really a kids movie. It's also about uh, like very much about flying very directly. It has the loom looming specter of war and, uh, and this, uh, this romantic notion that, uh, that, that becomes sort of like um, that, that sort of doesn't, doesn't save anyone from, uh, from what's going to happen. And I think that that, that also returns here with, um, with the romance with Naoko. Um, uh, where like you you once again have have this like classical cinematic romance like it's a uh, it's almost like um it's not Casablanca it's it's a more traditional sort of like meeting in a in a like uh, a hotel slash like boarding house up in the mountains and the faded reunion it's it's very old school romantic uh, in many ways uh, and, and but. Uh, it also kind of plays into a few like tropes of like uh uh you know the uh, uh the woman as uh as like not as, not necessarily object but the, at the very least as a tool through which the the great man protagonist gets like uh gets character development um what what do you guys th uh, think about that we we talked earlier about how there's there's some some uh, feminist critique you could you could make of it. I, I kind of feel like I want to kind of attack this first from the the other direction, where we kind of establish a bit more in of our reading on the romance, and then we express the criticism because I feel like we've criticized the romance many times in this podcast so far, but we've never really talked about what it does aside from that. And uh, I don't know if you agree, and I am just under I'm just undercutting your question here, but uh, I'd mm. really like to get into the very, I guess, existentialist reading of this romance in the context of the, the blowing winds. Yeah, sure. Well, okay. So what's interesting about the first meeting with Naoko is not only that they meet on a train uh, as they go to Tokyo and the earthquake is about to hit, but they meet and the hat is blown away and they catch it and they recite this poem at each other, right? She's saying like the first line and uh, Jiro completes with the other line, which is of course this poem about the wind rising, the Paul Valéry uh, uh, French poem that we've uh, had multiple times. The wind rises, we must try to live would be the translation for it, which is in a, in a weird way, foreshadowing the upcoming earthquake because as we already understand the rising wind is catastrophe and i've 
went, I've gone a little bit into my idea of how catastrophe allows us to read this movie, how we need to understand events as signified by catastrophe. And I will establish this more through looking closer at their relationship. So, of course, the first inciting incident is catastrophe that lets them meet. But interesting enough, in that summer resort, which they go to, the Magic Mountain summer resort, basically, where which is really removed from the ills of the world, which is sort of this repressed liminal space where it is allowed for you to have a good summer despite the world turning to fascism and catastrophe. Even their catastrophe strikes in, strikes in a very minor way. For me, in one of the most important scenes to their romance, which is when they meet at the well and... Now Cold cries and says, I was wishing for the well to bring me to uh, bring you to me. It's been so many years. And then they walk home together in the rain. And her painting is getting completely wet. So it is ruined. It is a catastrophe in a way. It it changes what the painting looks like. But they talk about it. And he's like, Jiro's like, But your painting got wet, it's ruined now. And she's like, No, it'll help me remember this day, basically. This is another indication of um how catastrophe serves in giving meaning and signifying sort of important moments to life. We have this world which will constantly upheave and blow hard winds your way, but these catastrophic moments are what makes many moments meaningful in the first place. And the same thing is true for her illness. So their marriage is rushed and brought to fruition in front of the backdrop of her almost certain death if she stays with Jiro. But this is the one thing that is supposed to be the central and meaningful element to their marriage. The catastrophe gives meaning in the first place. And, you know, the alternative could be, we could imagine this would not make for a good romantic narrative, but she stays in the sanatorium, tries to get healthy for him, and dies because her, thick, her sickness was too bad. This relates to the ending as well, where the kamikaze planes, uh, the Zeros, inevitably turn into catastrophe. But we see on the horizon Naoko yelling to him and saying, you need to live. And with this, Miyazaki in this movie means you must try to live very intensely, as hard as you can, basically, in the moments you are given. Which to me is an existentialist theme. We have this world marked by catastrophe and almost by accident, tragedy, the absurd itself, all of these meaningful connections, all of these beautiful things get destroyed and inevitably taken away by the winds of time, by the winds of whatever force is, is making them so, by the absurd world that will cast an earthquake onto Tokyo like for literally no reason. Nature is, of course, inherently a catastrophe in the sense that we cannot assign meaning to an earthquake except by you know what the earthquake does to us. Uh, because nobody caused the earthquake, it's just so. As same as the curse of technology, that it will inherently make humans do terrible things. But that in this circumstance, in this condition of human existence, of catastrophe, you as an individual have to make decisions and have to try to live as hard as you can, making things meaningful for you and around you, no matter you know how naive or self-destructive or ignorant or repressed, uh, repressing of important social issues they might be. And this is a common thread throughout the whole romance of Naoko and Jiro through these smaller symbols I've identified, as well as tying into the larger themes of the movie. So really what yeah, this... Of, of, yeah. of, of, the, uh, of the central quote, uh, the wind rises and we must live, which is from a poem that's about World War I another like generation defining catastrophe yeah exactly and i mean in the same way as in in from up on poppy hill we talked a lot about how the catastrophe of war helps these kids you know identify who they are locate themselves in their times find their roles find inspiration we have catastrophe as the leading dri driver of meaning in this movie as well what is complicating this of course is how this existentialist mode of living as i alluded to earlier eerily reminds us of self-destruction. It reminds us of take, in order to live your hardest, you have to make unwise decisions. You have to be involved in things that are dangerous, potentially lacking in humanity or solidarity, potentially ignorant of issues they might cause down the line, just so you can have this intense, meaningful living. And this is really the, I guess, deadlock that... I find this movie to exist in, especially also with the Naoko romance, which in a way, this whole issue of catastrophe, this whole issue of unwise decision 
is the very point, the very case this movie makes for why marriage as an institution, for example, is beautiful, right? Um, this is, it, it makes this case to us. It says these, uh, uh, this relationship, they started this marriage to give each other the promise to live through these uncertain and disturbed times together. And yeah, no matter the, in uh, which uh, fire it may crash and burn, that is their vow. You know what I mean? It, 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 I, I think it, that's it, it, what it's makes the... Sorry, go, go ahead then. It's just, you know, the, the moment in which um, they decide to get married, right? So we, we, talk, we talked about the catastrophe of her first painting, you know, getting destroyed by the rain. But the second time we see her painting um, is when she coughs up blood and yeah. she's basically like, you know, I can't do oh, that. No, and, and, no the, the, the second time we see her painting is when, uh, well, we don't see her painting, see, but like... See, see her painting. At the stream. Sorry, that is her, the stream that she she thanks the stream for like bringing uh, him, him to sorry, her. We Once see again, her, like her pa- personifying paint, nature. Paint, her painting, not her, see her painting, not, not verb. The, 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 the painting. The, yeah. 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 painting. We, see, we don't see her painting, but we see her painting. Right, yes, yes that makes yes, sense. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah and, when we learn um, that her it, it, condition has yeah. worsened considerably. And, and, yeah, that's such and, a and, powerful and, and, image. And, and that is another piece of, you know, another element of catastrophe, right? We we, we get, you know, another another painting gets gets destroyed by, you know, a natural force beyond the control of the people. The wind is rising. It's not the rain this time. It's it's it's, it's something that's, you know, she's caught. It's, it's, this, it's this tuberculosis that she coughs in the painting. It's, it's a strange scene because, like, you see the, the blood on the painting and the blood kind of, like, Almost makes the painting way more beautiful than it was before. Like it, like it colors it and can kind of yeah. gives it the kind of the kind of the kind of meaning, which catastrophe is catastrophe signifies. Yeah, yeah. If, if you think yeah. It's interesting, right? These are both st- scenes of her painting, of her creating something, of her doing art, which are given context and meaning through catastrophe, which is exactly how the the the, the in planes work, right? So we can see, you know. Her subjectivity in art history is pretty clearly um, defined through here. If we we only see it through kind of um, zero subjectivity, we see her kind of her 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 creations in, through, through through that lens, which I, I find really interesting. And if we get to the marriage, like we see these two these two to the two times right with the with the um, with the with the painting getting destroyed by the water and the and getting destroyed by the blood is both you know, water and blood. Um, you know, obvious sim, sim, um, um, symbolism there. Um, 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 those move towards the movements in their relationship, where the relationship def- is not just defined by catastrophe, it is given meaning and beauty by catastrophe. They only have that in each other, right? And that's kind of the, kind of the, kind of their, and the original media, of course, also comes from catastrophe. They, 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 they both have would, this kind um, of, kind of terrifying fatalism to how they define their beauty, how they understand the world. And they're, and they're both creators. They're both people who think in this kind of aestheticized manner. Like you see this in their, like their, their, the cutest um, um courtship scene in all of, you know, Cinema when they throw, <laughs> when they throw when they throw the um, the little plane together they they, they have they have they, they they both have a penchant for this kind of like quirky hyper aestheticized way of approaching you know everyday existence um and and, he, and, he, and, he, and, and I and I think it's just kind of fascinating how say the marriage is 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 something that's violent is something that's clearly like imposed on them but is something that's just they find beautiful because that's how they see meaning right like well, so they get married because also... they will die. And they know they Did we bring die. up the wedding scene itself, where Naoko is essentially made to look kind of like a traditional ghost? Yeah, like yeah she, the, the paper glowing. lantern and yeah, that's the, an amazing the, co- like yeah, the, the, the coloring and lighting of the entire scene is done like very washed out and like um, paoli, yeah. and it's like pretty much if you sh- if you showed that like one shot of the, her walking down the the little pathway to anyone, you'd probably assume it was from like some sort of ghost movie because it's so like. Yeah. Um, eerie almost and like again it's the one scene where like they're in completely traditional get ups there's no modern suits or anything it's like a very well, um, it's, nostalgic it's, yeah. uh, like haunting kind of image yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's um, but it also seems kind of you know it, 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 I mean, the, the ghostiness of it seems very much to to show that kind of like it's over it's, it's falling apart everything's coming like in going for the marriage which is supposed to be an indication of life it goes to it through the ele- through the route of death I would say say it that way, right? Yeah, it's, especially um, <laughs> when you consider how weak and frail she is when she enters the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he, 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 he's the he catcher. Her. Yeah, yeah. catcher. Yeah. She always falls over. It's like yeah, it's, it's, it's an incredibly fatalistic kind of yeah. scene, and like understanding that like their relationship is going to yeah. end any second now. And like, and, they and, might and, as well and, like and get married. Boss, you know, and his boss and his wife who are marrying them are like, "This is a bad idea. You guys are you know, yours are falling apart." And they're like, "No, this is how we do it. This is this is this is who we are." I think I think one thing that makes the 
makes the romance like uh, genuinely beautiful. It's like we were talking a lot about, about how catastrophe and, and their relationship to it and stuff. But I, th- I think the romance is also the one element of like uh, serendipity, of, of good fortune, of like, like fate pulling these two people together. Uh, like the 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 moments in which uh, nature like catches uh, his hat, catches uh, her uh, parasol later, and it just like it's it's fortuitous. It's 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 something that like something unpredictable, but in a good way. And, yeah, you guys and, and, keep and the, saying all the rest of the movie but... is filled with like the this the sense of like uh, of bad luck. Like even even his um, his talent for uh, for building planes his passion for that is a kind of catastrophe because of the circumstances of his birth in pre-war japan if he had been born any other time his his uh, abilities might not have been used to create like devastating war machines who knows yeah and uh, you guys yeah. keep bringing up catastrophe um i don't know if i entirely agree with that characterization i guess i can see your point but no i read it far more broadly as kind of like in a way, the winds that we see in the movie, like you mentioned, playing with the the hat as well, um, it kind of is more more of a, just a general thing of like it's life itself. It's like it, it it's going to keep throwing like tragedies at you, but then it also like allows life to be beautiful. Not only is the wind the thing, you know, the planes themselves can fly on, but yeah, it, the hat that connects them originally, the wind that blows the parasol, uh, so that they meet again all those years later. Uh, yeah. And even the the scene with the rain, where her painting gets ruined, you know, the, uh, for a second, then the wind blows, and then the rain stops, and they look back behind them, and there's like a rainbow, in, in like yeah, the most and, obvious and, symbolism. And sim- similar to the um, to the uh, the looming specter of, uh, of of war and all these societal changes that uh, these individuals don't really have much control over, mm. uh, the wind is also like a force that you can not see by itself, but you can see it, its effect on things. So- Similarly, yeah. you can't see war, but you can see you can still feel it coming by by looking around. It's it's a really good like metaphor for like f- fate and uh, and like the unpredictability of life. So I want to speak to the first for a second. Hipster, right? catastrophe A, I don't think is being presented as like an a completely just a negative thing, right? It, it, is, it is just a element which causes things to spiral out of control in some way or another, right? Like. You know, like, 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 that doesn't necessarily mean it's like a, like, this is a horribly violent thing at every. Yeah, you're right. Like, I guess we're but, using that definition. Um, I, but, I but, but, but I think further and, and more interestingly is um, the fact that while they are living, while this, like, kind of the wind is the kind of the element of, of you know, going through life, or living through it's, it is how they spin the narrative, how they decide to live. And they decide to live in a way where they define all their kind of meaning and love and life through catastrophe through fatalism through living life 10 years of a good artist through dying tuberculosis this is how they see it they're ghosts you know and i think that's that's really important to to, to note here right like you could live in a way where they they didn't do that where she went to the sanatorium where he's he got rid of his his his, his job and went and like tried to care for her and they did their best to get better and could live but for them that's not that's not a defined living living to them is riding the winds of catastrophe and I think that's really important to note in the film. And yeah, yeah, I don't disagree. Uh, I guess we're using catastrophe in a broader, like, literary yeah. sense. Yeah. And should I, we, and should I, we get into the um, the, the, the feminist uh, critique of like Naoko's character? I mean, I, I just wanted mm-hmm. to briefly attach to the idea of the wind that the wind, as an okay. agent of time, as an agent of change, is uh, it's a really interesting uh, and pressing especially if we consider uh, someone we haven't really talked about so far which is cast up the german who is also residing at the summer residence who's basically escaping from uh, germany where he's politically persecuted for whichever reason uh, we have to assume because he's anti-hitler anti-fascist and he is in this resort but joyfully witnesses the birth of this new love while the winds of time are blowing around him. And he says, Germany, Japan, it's going to lead to catastrophe. It's going to lead to whatever cruelty, war. But he's still there celebrating this one moment and singing that German song. By the way, his voice actor isn't German in the Japanese version. It's, it's American. It's very <laughs> oh, noticeable. His pronunciation isn't very good. Neither Arnos, whatever. Leaving that aside. Uh, and the song they sing is, and I have the advantage of being German, so I kind of understand the lyrics very uh, immediately. Um, das gibt's nur einmal is the title of the song. And basically, it only happens once or that it only exists once. 
And the lyrics are all mm. about this. It only happens once, won't be happen again, uh, won't be happening again. Maybe it's just a dream. Life can just offer it once. And basically ends with the line of, for every springtime does just have one month of May. It is all about transience and, uh, you know, a beautiful moment within these ever-changing times. And the film it comes from is a film, uh, uh, a German movie called Congress Dances, the Congress Dances, where it is about the Congress, the Vienna Congress uh, in the in the nineteenth century, which basically divided the European continent uh, after the Napoleonic Wars. If I'm getting this completely right, and in the thirties, when this movie came out, mocking the Congress of Vienna, which was this film was meant to be about, meant a uh, sort of a commitment. Uh, for reshaping Europe after World War One and dismantling the old empires. So it was an expression of democracies. It was an expression of uh, solidarity. It was an expression of sort of the political left even to uh, invoke this image. And this movie and this song contains at once a message of sort of Mono Novara-like transience of this beauty of things that pass and change with the times and moments you appreciate. Like there's only month. Uh, there's only one month of May in every springtime, right? This one thing that happens once. But also associated with the political climate where it was calling for a change to a different world by specifically linking it to this movie, to this imagery that Castop is, of course, invoking. And clearly, um, Jiro has seen this movie because why else would he know the lyrics, you know? <laughs> um, um. It could, yeah. I mean, it could be there was a, it was a popular singing song. You know, they they did those back then. Oh yeah, but Which of is, course but Miyazaki does not accidentally yeah. choose those. Yeah, kinds right. of songs. Uh, I, I assume I assume it's quite intended. A bit like uh, yeah. La Tombe de Cherries yeah. uh, that they had yeah. in Pogarosa, like a very yeah. deep yeah. cut there that you know, you know meant to take more implications from. Yeah, but uh, now that we're here, I want to expand a little bit on the Magic Mountain before we go we we, we go to the feminist critiques because um, you know we, we we talk about Castorp and Castorp, of course, you know. Is the name of the protagonist of um of the Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann, um, and and the work of Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain is about um a bunch of people with tuberculosis in a sanatorium. Um, <laughs> um, it is the movie in a lot of ways the movie is like it very, it takes a lot from 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 the the Magic Mountain. But if, if a couple of things I want to note about Magic Mountain is like one of the core elements of that novel is the fact that these characters are all existing before World War One. Um. In this this area, the sanatorium, right? They're all from all over Europe. In this, I think it's in Switzerland, or maybe it's in the mountains of Germany. Yeah, I'm not sure. Swiss, Swiss Alps. Yeah, Swiss, Swiss Alps. Yeah, which is and why the the who, summer residence where they are all hang out in uh, wind rises also looks like the Alps for well, some reason. It's in the Jap it's in, it's in yeah. the Japanese Alps, yeah. um, <laughs> as they're called. Um, but um, 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 in that area, you have people from all over Europe. Like you know, this is pre World War One, and they're all just like hanging out. They're all they're all they're all kind of partying, but at the same time, is they're all like. Most of them don't actually have tuberculosis. They just like pretend to have tuberculosis, or the doctor is saying, "Oh, this symptom here is you having tuberculosis." It's almost like a little Kafka esque, um, where it's like they go through all these like doctors saying different things and stuff. Um, but like one of the core things is this whole like kind of idea of like World War One is coming, and the, all the characters kind of know that, right? But they're delaying it. They're like, "I don't want to think about. It. I don't want to think about the world. I am here in my magic mountain in my safe space, right, where I can celebrate the world. I can dance. I can like they 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 have even like um." Like uh, we can have a Valpergs knocked where things where events repeat and everything is like romances are fleeting. Everything is like kind of transient and illusory in that mountain, right? But and, and of course, of course, the, uh, the the novel ends with them all going back and going to World War One and all dying. Um, you know, German novels. Um, yeah, German novels. <laughs> um, yeah, if I remember correctly, um, Magic but, Mountain. When I researched it, just cursory a bit, it was like. He wrote it like as World War One broke out. Like yeah. he started writing it, but then like World War One happened as he was still writing it. Yeah. Uh, if I remember correctly. So like that would have clearly warped yeah, like yeah. the entire perspective of it towards <laughs> the ending. Like Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and and it's interesting when we apply it to this movie, right? Because like like, like Castor comes to, to this place, right? We, 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 we clearly we need we need a, we need a multinational like interaction of people to make it more like the place. We have we have a girl with tuberculosis, right? You know, just we we've got we've got we got both of those, those elements. Um, but I think what's really interesting is this kind of um, this kind of like we know there's a war, we know that things are bad, we know that like we we know that that there's kind of a how do I say it like a um, what was what's the, what's the word I had before? Like this kind of um. Um, this, 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 this kind of the, the world is coming apart, but like we need to find a way to find something beautiful here. Like we need to like 
and 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 and, and we, need, we need to find some way to you know conceive of our bodies as like healthy as like you know it's, it's not as healthy as sick 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 versus a, you know there's a sick europe and a healthy world right the, 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 the idea of like the transition machine when you go back to europe right when you go back to off the mountain you become healthy bodied so you, then you have to go fight in the sick europe to die right it's this it's weird interaction between sick and healthy bodies but like and now now because body is you know clearly she's a sick body but like in a healthy world right where she like finds like in the space she finds she's glows up she finds like meaning she's allowed to paint there she's plays her she's like quartz like every, everything is kind of has this kind of like um quality of like um I don't, it's hard to explain because it's like most of the world is, is a very kind of like dour kind of almost like kind of like you go from scene to scene and Jiro just kind of like observes the world going by but here Jiro is like the only time you kind of really see like Jiro kind of like celebrating kind of like dancing kind of like um in his own Valpurg's knocked you yeah. know it's like this kind of like <laughs> this celebration of himself and of everyone around him of the world and of wine and of song and like and of note also and, and of smokes yeah. And of note, also the Smokes. one case where his planes actually serve some beautiful end, not just some beautiful, yeah. you know, inherent, you know, they are beautiful, but he connects to someone using using a paper airplane, yeah. which is now cool. And, 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 yeah, and the paper airplane is the closest thing to the play airplane of his dreams, right? Yeah. And that's, I think, that really, really important to note. Um, and like, um, this space is transient, right? You have to leave the Magic Mountain. You can't stay there forever. But I think it's like, it is so important to like kind of the core understanding what the film is doing and why the film and why, honestly why the film doesn't I, why I don't really take a negative war perspective from the film is because of really because of this 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 whole segment because we kind of see this is this is kind of the ideal this is what we want to do but like we we can't because of our historical situations and maybe in part because of our kind of obsessiveness with this kind of transience right we need the transients to be transient um <laughs> or Jiro does or Miyazaki does um I don't know yeah, know, yeah. Connecting it once again to a Porco Rosso, we we have the exact same thing. Where we have the um, the uh, Adriatic Sea be this like fantasy place where all these pirates and people can like play and live in this adventure. But they're like the they eventually all have to leave. The the, the fascists come in and kind of like bulldoze the place because that's that's history. That's what happened, and we can only ever like have it for that moment and to appreciate it. Uh, and Miyazaki, yeah, always reluctantly having to admit that the history that would come and kind of ruin this ideal. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's it's almost like um, Castorp is like this kind of um, I mean, there's no surprise, there's no, no mistake for them taking a name. For, it's not just a reference Magic Mountain. The idea is like it's almost like a this kind of historical European literary figure coming in and being, yeah, we can enjoy this and find some beauty here, and we can sing this song of like you know Mononoaware together, but like you know. The world's fucked. You know the world's fucked, right? Like, you can't just do this. You can't just build your planes. You can't just have your silly romances, like, forever. Like, you know this is all going to fall apart. <laughs> yeah, you're right. He's named after you know a character. Th- that makes it even, like, more meta when you think about it, because uh, he literally references the Magic Mountain. He might as well have said, yeah. hey, it's me, man <laughs> from the Magic Mountain. I'm here <laughs> hey, to tell you me. that this is all bullshit and not <laughs> Magic real. Magic Mountain, man. And the war I'm is happening smoke. outside. Like, like it's, a, it's almost like a, a fantasy zone that they go into, and they have to eventually have to... Come back to reality. Yeah. So uh, at this point, I really need to uh, uh, mention today we're recording uh, for one of the f- first times in really limited time frame, which is why I'm kind of, uh, I guess we need to move on, even though it's really all engaging and interesting, and get to what Platon has been wanting us to get back to for the entire time, the feminist reading. <laughs> and I think that's now very appropriate because I think, Hipster, I want to latch on to you talking about transients about the wind about and also about thundy we'd have to leave the magic mountain and so on you know the the real feminist critique problem that i also fully agree with and this is like maybe a bigger slight against the movie from my perspective than whatever we could say about the depiction of war memory is that inevitably in the process of how this movie chooses to highlight uh, romance and the intensity of burning out in the place of glory it turns naoko into a figure who merely exists to be beautiful and then die for us to ponder how that makes Jiro feel and see the world. She isn't a subject herself. She's eaten up by Jiro's big dream. And with this, even her creative process, uh, the painting and so on, disappears and ceases completely, just as well as her own life is merely seen as something beautiful to disappear in his dream and not as something valuable in and of itself and this is really a notion that once 
realizing it, I can't really escape from accepting as a really strong and valid criticism of the romance in this movie. Yeah, as as as, um, as left wing and and forward thinking, uh, Hayao Miyazaki can be. He has a very like conservative ideal of romance, um, which really comes to it, co- comes forward in this movie. Like, it's obviously supposed to be this like this bit of like true beauty and uh, and pure love um, that uh, th- that that to like uh, compare and contrast with uh, his love of uh, uh, building planes, but. Like the the what exactly a pure love and and like a, a true love romance looks like becomes like this like uh, immediate surrendering of your of yourself to uh, to, to the other and uh, this like uh, idyllic domesticity where like even as she is like ill and debilitated she's still making the effort to clean up and to take his coat and yeah. uh, and, and all this and and sacrificing herself in those small but persistent ways that uh, that women are uh, expected in like heteronormative society to like be like subservient to the husband yeah uh, and and doing so with a smile and i, I think that's genuine genuinely like uh, w- one issue i have with uh, with miyazaki and his uh, his world and it also is, like, has, that, that that sort yeah. of thing is supposed to be like ideal and it also I, works I, in how jiro's masculinity is depicted right like he's this pure shining white knight he's like oh you broke your foot let me just get out my ruler and in a very professional and concise way help you and put you on my back and this is the thing the first moment where naoko observed him being like the perfect chivalrous dude i guess and yeah. you know she literally calls him the white knight in shining armor later and and she's so invested in this fantasy of the relationship between them also that later even though she's very sick she insists on folding his shirts and stuff like that doing household chores no matter how thick how sick she is so in this movie it is depicted sort of as beautiful that no matter the circumstance she would engage in trying to be the perfect wife despite everything so so i i i i think i think i have a few ways to counter that first of all i i she has subjectivity throughout the whole film. It's just we don't usually have get access to it because Jiro is very self obsessive. Like I, I think like you know you see this from the from her paintings, right? For the first two, you know, see time you see her, you know, creating something, and those things are are sort of you know symbolically you know disturbed by catastrophe the same way Jiro's planes are. So we understand her relationship to her art the exact same way we understand Jiro's relationship to his planes, if not given a, as fullest a holistic kind of like given the, the perspective of it. Um, but like um. I, I I think that um you can kind of understand her um her wish to serve as a domicile in the way that um so she she, she does she 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 like she like coughs blood all over her her painting right and she's like okay I can't do this anymore I can't paint anymore I'm too weak I've like I have I have no power of this thing that like gives me like this this kind of joy and so I guess the thing that the one last thing I can do in the time before I die like is is maybe maybe I can get married. Um, right. Yeah, there, there's I, maybe that like longing yeah. for normality there, but like I, I think it's not, that not, that's not, reading not, into not it. normality as much as a this is a thing that I find beautiful. Right, the the plain the little plain um courtship game they play. She's like they, she finds that beautiful. Like what she like I I think that the reason why the characters like love each other is not just because of their kind of faded meeting, even though the film kind of presents it that way. Because that's how Jiro sees it. I think it's because of their kind of shared perspective of aestheticizing the world around them. Right. That's why everyone's kind of shocked. Oh, they they go through things so quickly. They're like, so like, why are you getting married? Like, she's dying. You know, these these kinds of things, right? Because they they have a very like same perspective kind of way of thinking of the world. And like, even even his sister, right, comes in and says, "What the fuck? Like, why was she he, he, she, 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 to, to both of them for like you know kind of like you know acting the uh, way they yeah. are, right?" And, and, I, and, and, I think it's like 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 she she criticizes it right right, but it's important for Naoko to do that because she can't paint anymore. She doesn't have anything but this, and she knows she's gonna die. She went back to the sanatorium. She's like, I'm not getting better. Like, at least at least I can do is live out the end of this this kind of relationship I have with this person. Yeah, th- um, I think that's a good like counterpoint that that like uh, maybe when like uh, if, maybe when 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 you're like uh, on on the left wing like we are and uh, and and are uh, like really critical of like uh normativity uh and, and tradition and all this um what might get lost is like that that there are definitely people who find beauty and meaning in those sort of like tr- uh, traditional roles and uh, and traditional lives and then that th- that might be like what's what's happening here it's, it's interesting to note that his sister's a like the sister's a doctor Jiro's yeah. sister is not is not is not complicit in anything 
of, of, of Jiro's violence, right? Of the violence of the war. She only helps. She can only, she only heals. And she's like, and she's kind of a more quote unquote masculine figure, you know, than like, you know, the Naoko and like, but like, um, it's very clear that she kind of serves a more like kind of, this is a more quote unquote, maybe like a real woman, a more real person, a person who actually is considered the world as like a thing to like be in. And as a person who actually lives instead of just, um, you know, dies like Jiro and um, Naoko do together. Um, I think it's um, also interesting that she's a doctor. Maybe, maybe my read is mm -hmm. wrong on this, but like, it seems like it would be a bit like, I don't know, frowned upon or uncommon for like a woman in like the rapidly fascist, like growing uh, Japan. Yeah to like seek out like a very male uh like important job as opposed to being like a wife or like yeah like a more feminine so. job yeah. i think that was an interesting thing to have her be like yeah. a full educated doctor yeah and, she, and she's a scientist instead of an artist right i think that's that's also yeah. important yeah, to know, right true. like she doesn't understand the world like she that's just what she doesn't get it she's like what the fuck are you guys doing like what we, she's dying you know what are you doing you don't do anything she's like that's and he's basically like you want to understand right <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah it has ways. to be explained yeah, yeah. to her at the end where she doesn't understand why she's leaving for the sanatorium. I think yeah. it's interesting how Jiro should be a scientist because he's an engineer, but no, he's an artist. He's a fucking yeah. artist, okay? That that's what he does. Yeah. Yeah, he looks at fish bones for inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's, that's, a, that's a great little detail. Also, one bit. one scene I feel like we all totally forgot to talk about, unless my memory's wrong. That I feel kind of like re recharacterizes how you we were talking about Jiro is the one scene which he hears that she's sick, so he immediately like dashes hard as possible uh, right across Tokyo, gets on the first train he can, goes all the way through the night to see her, and then he just kind of like sees her and holds her hand for a bit, and then like leaves in like an hour. <laughs> yeah. So he like goes through real, all that effort, that like, just ship, kind of manic scene, romance. Ju just to like kind of like make sure she's yeah. okay. Because I feel like we that, kind of characterized him as yeah. a bit too cold and like not caring about her, which I feel like the movie definitely doesn't 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 want to show us. It wants to have more of his dedicated side. Yeah. And as for the, uh, the broader feminist critique, uh, I kind of agree with you, Nyard. I can't exactly like um, disprove it by saying she isn't used more of a of a plot device and like a stepping stone for Jiro in a sense. While she's fleshed out reasonably well. Uh, it's yeah. It's just I feel the movie is so coolly about Jiro, and like we say the same thing about the war, and it's kind of like the the same reasoning. Where Jiro was never in the war, he never like shot anyone or saw any planes blow up. So the movie doesn't really feature those things, and so we can only ever really show his perspective of the romance and of his wife. And like it would almost be like a bit weirder if she got too much screen time, but the movie was still ostensibly really from Jiro's perspective. So I feel in a weird way it's kind of being honest and maybe maybe Jiro is uh, abandoning her or like he's a bit neglectful at points and he's a bit self-centered and cares more about his planes, but that's like, you know, that's who he is. That's the character that we're being shown. So I think yeah. uh, like f saying that it's like the movie is somehow like worse off for not giving her more screen time is, again, kind of a prescriptivist approach. And like with, with, with many of these fem feminist critiques, you kind of want to apply it in like broader ways to cinema as opposed to saying like one movie specifically is yeah. bad for doing it this way. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. I, I kind of want to write a fan fiction from the perspective of Naoko just because I think it would be an interesting kind of literary exercise. Yeah, um, I was, I was, we'll link that to, one in the description. <laughs> I was honestly about to say this earlier. I wish we had this movie, but Naoko is the protagonist. That would be yeah. very fascinating. It would certainly be a very different movie, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I th uh, I think we're we're reaching the tail end of uh, of our discussions, um, but uh, I I, th I think um, Thundy, you you said you you uh, had a, had a eureka moment. Uh, you oh, said I, earlier. I, I already said about it. What, I, I, what the yeah. movie's about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I said it earlier. I think Jiro's a kamikaze pilot. Um, that's that's my eureka moment. So is Naoko. They're both kamikaze yeah. pilots. Um, yeah. I guess life is being like a kamikaze pilot. If we read this, it, it, I guess, mm. it, I guess, it, guys, I guess it kind of <laughs> wow. works. No, real, hold on, yeah. The real, 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 ja real Japanese apology hours here. Yeah, life is truly ka kamikaze. They, they were the real ones living. <laughs> <But, but, laughs> they were but, real ones. <laughs> but, but the other way around, obviously, like okay, kamikaze, yeah. the wind of God, right? Um, the the wind as as the image pervasive in this movie we understand what it means it means catastrophe it means bringing change it also means bringing beauty but it's all caught in the wind so the wind can turn it can lead to death downfall destruction all of these things right but uh, the the central message of this film seems to be to live as hard as you can despite the times and that makes you a kamikaze pilot right like you ride the winds of God 
in those um ways. i would I, I do agree though though i think the the very key thing uh like we're talking about it is that jiro is a failed kamikaze pilot he yeah. failed to die and yeah. yet he still has to keep going living yep. If that's good. I like that. It gives it this this connects to what Thundi said earlier about how yeah. survivors of Kamikaze were shunned. Yeah, it, yeah. There's a there's a weird almost like trying to like instead of like being shameful of the of not dying in the Kamikaze, it's almost like well, no, you can still live on. You can still keep going. There doesn't have to be shame in it, and you get the chance to live more. Uh, which, uh, again, like we said, maybe connects to Miyazaki's career, where he kind of maybe wishes that he burned out early, but he just he just keeps going, like nothing's stopping him. He's going to this day. I think another really interesting thing about this film um, is just kind of, kind of, kind of, kind of Miyazaki as an otaku, right, or Jiro as an otaku, as someone who just kind of doesn't see the world around them as much, right? They're kind of like are hyper-focused. They're in their room and they're watching their TV. They're building their little gumpla. They're, you know, they're, they, 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 they're kind of like hyper-obsession over these small set of things which they just understand and they love to death, right? Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but and, 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 and like the hiring of Anno kind of, I feel like, makes that clear, right? This whole film can kind of, you can kind of see it as almost like a, an, an otaku manifesto in that regard, right? Because... It, it 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 kind of approaches this kind of idea. Okay, yeah, the world is fucking terrible. Like everything is destroyed around you. Everything is bad. But if you just stay inside and build your 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 your, your and if you say, just stay inside and build your your planes or like write do your art or um or you know love your your dying um wife um <laughs> um things are not going to change outside. Things are just going to you know going to go you know, things are going to get bad. They're they're, they're going to like I think Miyazaki described um. I this, he almost had a description of I want to I sometimes just want to see the um the 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 tops of the towers of in in Japan in Tokyo um as waters flooded the city, but I can't write I can't write a movie about that. I have to write movies for kids who need to see a future and you see about the world, right? But the thing um, is, boy Shinkai came in clutch. <laughs> true, <laughs> um, but um, but like why, why is it, I call this film kind of like an otaku manifesto? Is it's kind of like yeah. It kind of takes the perspective that Miyazaki's been struggling with his whole career, right? Is that, like, I he really, we saw this in the, in the documentary where Miyazaki just plays with the plane and makes sounds, right? <laughs> he, he's he's an ota- plane otaku. He's a mechanics otaku. He's a he's you know he's a, he's a drawing otaku less so than he's a plane otaku, but he's all these things. He just loves those things that is a pure technical tactile thing that really matters. And like this movie is kind of like takes perspective. Of, look at this person. This person can see the world dying all around them, but they can still find this beauty. They can still you know, really get something wonderful and actually bring something to the world that is worthwhile through their kind of love of their craft, their love of the, 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 their, their, their planes, the love of just, you know, kind of the art of it. And, and, and mm. you can almost see like, if you see Jiro as those, one of those kind of intern, like those people who sit in their, their house all day watching TV, like that Miyazaki didn't like who likes his movies. Um, 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 you you kind of get kind of kind of start to get to a, a sense of Jiro more more like Hideko Hideko Anno, right? He really is in in a way he's not just Miyazaki, or rather he's not just Miyazaki's image of himself. He's Miyazaki's image of himself as projected through um, Hideko Anno. <laughs> mm. Yeah, uh, appropriate that he, that he got to voice him. Yeah, um, um, extremely. I, I, the the one thing I would disagree with there is like part of the way Miyazaki identify uh, otaku is that they 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 don't see the world they only yes, focus co- on that correct which yeah, Jiro does I, yeah yes yeah well but I I, I think Jiro does like like the whole ma- macro thi- bone thing like he di- does like see the world and draw inspiration from uh, from the natural world from from the way the wind blows and sure such. but only very is, narrow like, but only way. very narrowly in the sense of yeah, he is very down affects, in his affects, calculations affects, affects my, my, this is only very narrowly in how it affects his craft right he doesn't yeah, care yeah. about he only cares about macro bowl and he doesn't care about korea <laughs> mm. yeah <laughs> that, that's pretty that's pretty obvious yeah All right. i think that's um, really important to note about the point I think uh, I, th- I think I have uh, I have like my reading on the film. Uh, now we're reaching the uh, yeah uh, the concluding remarks. We we yeah. can do a round of concluding remarks about the movie. That that's about as much yeah. time as we have. <laughs> Go ahead, play. Yeah, um, yeah. So, um, flight is one of the core themes of uh, Miyazaki throughout his uh, his his career as a director. He uh, he clearly connects it with freedom, with fantasy, with the with animation itself. Um, 
and uh, we've talked a lot about it uh, throughout this uh, this podcast. Um, and I think like it's so incredibly appropriate that uh, his final film, or what was supposed to be his final film, but like it still feels very final, you know, um, is like really takes that um, the idea of flight um, and, and and takes the um, the sense of yearning that uh, that goes through his uh, his whole uh, oeuvre and puts it into the real world um, in a way that's like uh, he's make he's making this film not necessarily for an audience. He's not making a kids movie for girls to see that they too can like can fly or be alright with not flying like like with Kiki or like showing that a better world is possible. That's not what this is. This feels like a movie that. Uh, like like an exorcism, like 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 something that needs he needs to get out of uh, of himself at the end of it all. Um, it's uh, that's why it's it's open ended. It's not aspirational. It it problematizes. It's it it questions the uh, the whole notion of like so. What even is the value of of the cre- of being a, a creative person at the end of it all? What's the point of that yearning? Is it is is the yearning beautiful in and of itself? Does there need to be some sort of product out of it? And if that product, uh, like, has bad consequences, like, was it was it even worth it at, uh, at the end of it? Um, and the thing I, I, I find, uh, I've talked about this being a challenging movie, and it absolutely is because specifically because of that open endedness and and the questions it asks and the lack of answers, but it asks all the right questions. One of the questions is like, this is clearly a tragedy. Like it's uh, like it's it's all like good intentions uh, ending up in in uh, in death and uh, and and calamity. Um, but the big question is like, what exactly the tragedy is? Like the uh, the the most the the most immediate reading would be like, oh, the tragedy is a tragedy of circumstances. That Jiro was born in pre-war Japan. With all, with the this talent and dream of making planes, and that's the big tragedy that that there he is, and the world around him is just the wrong place at the wrong time, and that's the tragedy of it all. I, th- I think I, a deeper yeah. reading would say that Jiro a- a- actually it's a, it has a, the tragic flaw, his naivete, his his deep commitment to this particular craft, ignoring all the the consequences, all the implications of it. That's the big tragedy that he doesn't realize the um, the futility of of the pursuit until uh, until until the very end. But I think that's a that's an even deeper layer, uh, uh, and I think it's what the movie is ultimately about and what the final scene is about. The tragedy is kind of both. The tragedy is it lies in like the problem of life itself. That your uh, like that what even at the very end of it all, is the the meaning with doing anything at all, yeah. anything like creative, anything beyond your own happiness, beyond uh, beyond saving lives. Like like what what's what's the point? And particularly, the tragedy is that that these planes are so beautiful. Yeah, the tragedy is really that 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 the, that planes can be so ele- elegant and so beautiful and uh, and and works of art um when they are they're also destructive that's that, that's that's the that's the big tragedy uh, at, at, at the center of it all that some of the things that give gives life meaning doesn't necessarily improve the world yeah that, that's I think that's my uh, reading on that's it. very well put and I, I think I just want to piggyback onto what you said because I I agree for the most part completely um I I I felt uh, and I wrote this down in the chat yesterday you will remember these words is that this movie despite having a very obvious thesis statement about the wind rising and all that doesn't feel very conclusive it doesn't feel like it has the answers what it does is it feels like y- the confusion you might also feel when you ponder all the beauty and destruction life and decay and all the ways they intertwine to form you know the absurd surrounding us and the way people make meaning out of the world despite all that we end uh, this movie none the wiser honestly just enhanced by one enriching and very humanist perspective on uh negotiating meaning and in particularly challenging and trying times and this movie instead of solving life's questions for us uh, posits them at us and 
even sees them as, to some degree, irresolvable, as though this paradox is not to be solved. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's it's the work of a of of a master at the at, at the tail end of his career, like really, really having the uh, the broad overview of, of things, uh, having having like a sense uh, a wisdom to not necessarily know the answers but ask all the right questions um i thought it's 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 absolutely a masterpiece and and his most challenging but also one of his most rewarding works well hopefully it's not the tale of his career and we get another 30 years of miyazaki that's my (laughs) miyazaki 100 years miyazaki has gotten so confused his next movie is gonna be called how do you live (laughs) <laughs> yeah, now he's like, wait a second, like, <laughs> y- like, f- fuck all that with like, what gives life meaning? How do you even live? What what does a heartbeat mean? <laughs> ah, <laughs> it gets even deeper. <laughs> I've chain smoked too much <laughs> for this life. <laughs> You're right, but he's still going strong. Like he's he's rather gonna die at the uh, the animation desk or I don't know what, just like live forever. Like, you know, it's just going to yeah. be this case that he releases this movie and he dies like two days after it's been released in cinemas like David Bowie with Black Star. And it's just going to be like, well, Miyazaki didn't figure out how to, li- how to live clearly. Yeah, there's, there's um, the documentary, uh, The Kingdom of uh, Dreams and Madness. Uh, after the, the whole thing is finished, he like he, he, he goes out like there, there, there's, um, there's applause for him when, when, when he like... Uh, like goes goes out and then he just like walks up the stairs uh, towards the light um, in, in a really beautiful shot, and I think it um, I think that really parallels uh, Jiro in this movie. There's there's this really sad sense that like um, the the the, mo- the feeling that Miyazaki most relates to is that feeling of having accomplished something great and not necessarily like being happy about it, but just like it, it, that's just how it's supposed to uh, to be at the end of the day. Just doing it because it it feels right, even though like you have all these doubts about like why you're even doing it in the first place. Yeah, it's it's almost like um, we we're saying like the finding finding like how to live is you know the process of living itself. It's it's. Um, that's kind of the yeah the core thing with the movie like it just keeps going and particularly does not end on on death which i think is the the most important like kind of factor right there uh i don't know if i have any other closing thoughts uh, i feel like we're trying to we said everything we could um all right certainly like miyazaki's most like maybe he's probably his most personal and like spiritual film he's made uh yeah. One, 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 one thing I, would, I did wanted to also say is I, I think watching the documentary is it was very interesting to notice notice this as a a thing that was said by Suzuki because Suzuki probably talks the most in the whole documentary um, yeah. about um, his relationship with Takahata uh, and uh, how uh, Takahata um, is like really distant like he's he's barely in the entire movie because he's in the other studio and apparently like they mentioned that like him and Miyazaki like barely talk at all anymore, at least when they're on film productions. But Suzuki says, I think something of like, they're both at their best and like most like fulfilled when they're like both making movies and like also kind of not near each other. Cause they, they like, they argue and like get on under each other's skin when they're talking, but when they're like kind of both trying to outdo each other and like live their own path, they can like respect each other in that beautiful way. And that just really reminds me of, Caproni and uh, Jiro, where they technically never meet in reality, but Jiro is always having these dreams of this kind of like guy who's also trying to make these beautiful planes, and he's kind of like contacting him through that this uh, constant uh, idea of like pushing himself to uh, follow this ideal. You know what yeah. it reminds me of? It reminds me of the next movie we're going to cover in the next episode of the Nausicaas, which is going to yeah, be... Yeah, the, the, the one that Takahata was developing parallel to uh, to this one. And he released yeah. it late because initially they planned a simultaneous cinematic release, but it was late yeah. by three or four months and, or something like that. An echo of like My Neighbor Totoro and uh, the Grave of the Fireflies uh, releasing at the same time. Yeah, it would have been a poetic close, but, uh, but instead 
Uh, it's after Kahada apparently didn't didn't really want to finish it. Yeah, it's funny because the, the roles are kind of reversed, right? Because um, <laughs> yeah. um, the character Kimi is this this is the fantastical one versus the Wind Rises being the more grounded one. Indeed, yeah. and you said yeah. it just now, Kaguya Hime, the tale of Princess Kaguya, is going to be the next movie we're going to be covering in the next Nausicaa's. Unfortunately, we are going to take another break. First of all, Christmas holidays are coming up, which is, which is a busy time in general, overall. But also for me, uh, I am in the process of writing my master's thesis, which is due 1st of February, and I do want to take the January off to really focus on that. And, uh, you know, it's also going to be Nausicaa's content, to be clear, because it's a master's thesis written on when Marnie was there, which is going to hopefully bring interesting and insights. Expect that to episode to just be in Yard reading his entire thesis. <laughs> uh, into the yeah, we're going to just be quiet and I'll ask questions at the He's end. He's done all the work for us. It's going to be an audio book or, you yeah. know. But leaving that aside, I definitely hope you will uh, stick stick it out with a long wait. Kaguya Hime is going to be a big one because it's also a pretty big movie. The capstone of uh, Isao Takahata's career because he died after the completion of this movie. Uh, uh, and this makes it his final movie, one of the most important directors of anime uh, in general. But uh, until then, you can always support us paying our uh, bills, uh, uh, the like the hosting costs for this podcast by supporting us on patreon.com slash Narsicast with double A, no umlaut. And uh, other than that, I hope you enjoyed our coverage of The Wind Rises and will uh, subscribe and, you know, you into the next episode or whatever you do on all those podcasting apps. Maybe leave a comment. Does anyone comment on podcasting? <laughs> I don't know. Do it if you can. All right. But on that note, I would say uh, goodbye until next time. Yeah.